And I will call our meeting to order. It is June 19th, 2019. Select board meeting will begin. Just start here real quick with our consent agenda. Um, we have a few warrants. War warrant AP1950, AP1950-S, AP1951-2, PR-1948. Um, the town clerk asks that the select board vote to discontinue the use of the ACCU dash vote tabulator and authorize the purchase of new equipment, a DS200 for intended use at the March 2020 primary. And then we have a town treasurer extension of agreement. Town has entered into an employment agreement with the town treasurer that will expire on June 30th, 2019. Treasurer requests an extension of that agreement as opposed to a formal contract at this point until the select board has hired a human resources director. Motion to approve. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Um, <coughs> we do have an appointment with the planning board at 645, but I think if everyone's okay, we could just get started on that now. Does that sound good? Everyone's here? Uh, Jim is not. Yeah, so oh, Jim's right there. He just, okay. just oh. came Jim is here. Or else I'd wait. Yeah, but is that, is that fine if we start? Okay, yeah. so we so we have a uh, list of items here um, that I kind of put in here for us to review. Now, we don't have to hit all these items. Uh, just for those watching and those in the crowd, we have uh, examining zoning to maintain affordable housing and to add customers to the water and sewer system. Planning for a planner in fiscal year 2021 and beyond. Amending zoning restrictions on the size of commercial buildings. Uh, an issue with recreational vehicles on the riverfront. Uh, coordination of projects and development with the DPW. Review of the master plan and next steps toward implementation and zoning <coughs> articles for the special town meeting and beyond. Um, but I think we are going to, uh, Mr. Kenneth Comia and Ms. Lori Tanner of the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission are here uh, to look at affordable housing in Hadley, so I figured we'd start with that. Um, and I don't know if you guys would kind of like, to, you have anything prepared to present to us or just participate in the discussion? Um, yeah, so I think I'll probably introduce just kind of the, the you know, the work that um, Hadley has um, as granted by our executive director at Peter PC. First of all, I'm Kenneth, uh, Ken Comia with um, Pioneer Valley Planning Commission. This is Lori Tanner. And we're going to be working jointly with uh, the select board and the planning board if, you know, if that is the, um, if the planning board decides to, or the select board asks the planning board to, you know, oversee um, some of the work of this particular affordable housing analysis. Um, the request that was granted by the executive director came from the town administrator, um, and it was to discuss um, how to maintain um, the the current housing what they call subsidized housing inventory, which is at 13% currently. Um, and that, that, that is what the state uh, lists as affordable. Um, some, some are governed by covenants, which are expect, expected to expire within the next decade. And um, the town is committed to maintaining um, the affordable housing as part of its overall economic development strategy as outlined in the master plan. So I think um, in our initial meeting with the town administrator and, you know, Dave, if, if there's anything that you want to add to this, um, was that we were going to basically take inventory of the various housing um, units that are covered under the covenant and then explore, um, explore the uh, various types of housing projects eligible for CDBG and um, CPA funds, which is uh, community development block grants and your, um, what is that acronym always alluding? Community, community, community preservation, preservation um, funds. Um, 
in addition to exploring existing agencies and organizations that are involved with providing affordable housing opportunity like Wayfinders. Um, and then evaluating coordination with the other municipal documents of which include um, any sort of zoning regulation or um, your CPA plan, master plan. Um, and then providing recommendations at the end of the study to maintain the SHI over 10% over time in compliance with the master plan. Um, so I think it really was an initial survey. There's $7,500 that was granted to the town for this study. Um, initial survey of you know what currently exists and kind of examining and um, looking to the future in regards to trying to maintain that 10%. Um, I don't know, David, if you wanted to add anything. Yeah, so thank you uh, for that introduction. It was a, a conversation that was developed between the select board and the planning board months ago when the planning board brought the uh, affordable housing as a concern to the select board. And I think uh, all eyes turned to me and said, okay, make it how this happened. Um, but if you think about affordable housing and how that is an important part of our local economy, if you think about the service industry, which makes up a lot of the retail and commercial space in the town of Hadley, uh, it's important for us to maintain a, a good mix of housing types um, so that we can have affordable housing for many different kinds of uh, people who work in the town of Hadley. Hadley's fortunate to be at 13% of SHI, which is above the state threshold of 10%. Um, we would like to maintain that at the minimum. Uh, what do we need to do in order to do that? PVPC was good enough to uh, grant our request for a direct <coughs> local technical assistance grant to begin this project. S probably $7,500 is not enough to complete what we need to do, but it's a good beginning. Uh, and thank you for taking the time to be here for tonight. When you say affordable housing, is it a unit? How do, how do you define an affordable <coughs> unit? Is it a single room occupancy? Does it have to be a bedroom and a bath and a kitchen and an area, or how is it defined? Um, it, would, it would not be just a, a SRO, single room occupancy. It would be housing that's affordable to a variety of so, so, families and individuals. Um, I've just been reading about the newspaper that Amherst is going to be put affordable housing in a, uh, the old Kitty house by Amherst on football field. They're going to be putting in single occupancies and they're calling that affordable housing so are they wrong well it's a type of affordable housing um no. so that won't that won't go into the 10 percent well that could that could count so as you just told me no okay it depends on yeah it depends on what you want yeah well affordable i'm just housing. i guess that's where our strategy yeah. comes into plan too yeah. because there's strategies of single room occupancy yeah. housing that could be worked toward affordable housing yeah. but i think does affordable housing there's the criteria of affordable housing, and then there's moderate income housing where families can afford mm -hmm. housing well, that just, might be confused with affordable. Yeah, we just keep talking about the 10%. What goes into the 10%? Could it be a single room occupancy house? Sure. It could, okay. So my moderate income, Dave, with the, the units that are gonna be converting over to moderate income down there. Mm -hmm. Moderate does count toward the percentage, right? I believe so. I'm not. I, I would have to review the exact threshold of whether it's 80 percent of um, yeah, so the median income. So I think 80, the moderate is considered to be 80 percent <coughs> of uh, household income. Uh, what are? Why are we raging as this concern? We have the highest percentage in Happy Valley, in Hampshire County, 13 percent. Yes, we realize, but if under the normal situation, we have 10 houses built per year. If we build no more affordable units, I'm not talking about the ones that will come off the roll, it'll take 60 years to get us down to 10%. Sunland, what are the sanctions if we don't have 10%? Sunland has less than 1%. Hatfield has 4%. Belchertown, 7%. Cummington, 4%. I mean, they are all 
below the 10%. What are the sanctions if you go below the 10%? Well, I know that they can overrule zoning, but it appears that we're leading the pack with affordable housing, and the other towns don't seem to be carrying their burden or their share of affordable units. And from the planning board perspective, if you build 10 houses as subdivision, one has to be affordable. So we have something in place so that we won't fall below the 10%. And also, too, the CPA has a lot, a lot of money sitting aside that's designated for uh, such units. That's not even being used. And Barry Roberts set some money aside for his 55 and older housing. So there's some money in a pot that's not being used. And uh, well, we know that Billy Barry Roberts's units are not aff low income affordable. Well, the ones that he has now. It, no, it, but he, what he put them, he's, there's there's about three hundred and fifty thousand dollars going into a fund that exactly, the town can exactly. use for affordable housing. So he's going to build more. No, 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 no. 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 It's go. He, Trust he when he put the <coughs> so his things in the uh, senior housing. Yeah. There was still on the zoning bylaw book that you could put it into a fund. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And with the zoning board of appeals and the planning board's agreement, he put money into a fund, even though we don't have the so-called. Uh, is a what is sure. the no. affordable housing trust, 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 trust we don't have a trust fund we have, but we, have a, we have we have about three hundred fifty thousand that'll be sitting in the town coffers for affordable housing to be used say that somebody wanted to come in and wanted to convert something we could we could use that towards affordable housing but so where does that money, that money sit right now Pardon? we don't have that no money. we don't have the money right now because of the, his 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 plan his plan his facility is not built out or sold out. No, just looking at the treasurer. Is, is that the plan right that he'll actually turn the money over to the town, hmm? or or they'll, they'll hold it and trust no, elsewhere? No, no, the town we'll is going to hold it. Oh, great. Okay. Once he builds the last place, well, and he's he has everything over there sold. It's just a matter of getting it built. Once mm -hmm. it's all built and occupied, we will get it. But then there does have to be a holding place for it, and we have right. talked in the planning board about the affordable housing trust. And some people argued that it might be too difficult to administer. Well, Whaley's got one, Leverett's got one. Mm -hmm. If they can handle it, I think Hadley, Hadley could handle it. And I'm just talking so, out loud, this is not planning board stuff, but I think if we had a trust like this, money could be put in it and it could be built up over the years and then we could use it to do something a bit larger. So the parallel is our agricultural preservation restriction program, or our uh, transfer development rights program. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The money that the developers put into that to get an increase in density or a decrease in parking, in turn, has funded the APR purchase. Mm -hmm. So the town meeting doesn't have to appropriate money to be applied to APR purchases. All of that is off the tax rolls now. Right. Um, so I think ideally the trust fund, and I agree with Mike on the need for the trust fund, but there's not a consensus on the board about that. That. Um, Having the affordable housing trust fund would have would create a resource that could uh, begin to meet some of these needs. And I'm also in agreement with Joe on not needing affordable housing right now either, with us being at 13 yeah. children. But, but, but I think we, I think we yeah, that con this conversation came about because <coughs> we were going to have some come off. Right. Yeah. There's, there's no nothing we to the overall point. There's nothing we need to jump into or oh, we're in trouble. Mm -hmm. I think we need to plan. And one of the things that even we asked Joel Bard about the affordable trust, he says, well, you have another option. He says, you could put it into a similar fund like your TDA. You could call it, he called it, I think he called it an, not an enterprise fund, but he called it something along the line of an enterprise where you could draw from it, dedicate it strictly to housing, but you wouldn't need all of the paperwork that is required for a housing trust fund. He says, so, so there's other ways that you may be able to administer it without going through that particular wording. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and that could be something that, you know, PVPC <coughs> can look at it. What, what are our options <coughs> with even just that little bit of the, of the puzzle? Yeah. So, so I, I think, um, so I thought from my standpoint that the conversation we were hoping to, to start, not finish or solve tonight, but 
if if we know that there's a 10 percent requirement we know that we're above it right now but we know that over time we're eventually going to start sliding backwards um, I think we were hoping to maybe have a more proactive conversation about you know again year, years down the road <coughs> do we need to set money aside in this trust and, and as you said do something on a bigger scale um, and have a plan in place to bring something like that online you know Joe started the conversation by saying well if we don't do it what, what's the penalty but I think from a planning standpoint you know does it make sense for the town to be adding more affordable housing for the reasons that David stated you know we have a lot of people making a living in Hadley that can't afford to live in Hadley um, and I think you know that housing topic was really came up loud and clear in the master plan and that, uh, what can what can we do over like the next multi-year period to set ourselves up to be adding some affordable housing stock and where might that stock so the exist? conversation goes even the roots go even deeper yeah. because <clears throat> I'm going to make some very broad generalizations here but based on the market based on what has been built as affordable housing mm -hmm. uh, multi-unit dwellings seem to be the norm. Mm -hmm. um, you're not seeing, by and large, there may be one or two uh, Habitat for Humanity type right. buildings, but <clears throat> by and large, uh, you're looking at multi unit <laughs> dwellings, and Hadley has always been zoned for one dwelling per lot. Right. So <clears throat> there, there's some threshold questions to get into. Yeah, and much. then you get into, yeah. and here's some of our. Uh, displays that I hauled out. This was done for another purpose a long time ago, but when you are dealing with multi-unit dwellings, you're almost necessarily dealing with something that's on sewer. Right. And so we don't have, uh, we have a lot of land that's not on sewer. Mm -hmm. So you're concentrating your development discussion uh, into a relatively small area. So that would be, the sewer roughly runs along Route 9. There's some spurs on East Street, uh, West Street and Middle Street. Then it runs up River Drive through the center of North Hadley, then around Lake Warner and back down North Maple? No. No. Oh, okay. Stockbridge. Stockbridge. Stockbridge, yeah. And, okay. And keep That's the mind, old Amherst line. And keep in mind how much of that is under APR or other restrictions, too. Right. So on this map, and this is not current, this is a number of years ago, but <clears throat> green is all APR, uh, red is already developed, and um, there are other areas that are developed, but um, you know, that, that gets into some of, uh, on the, on one hand, it seems like a good starting point is let's let's allow multifamily dwellings, uh, but that then triggers where are we going to allow them? Well, you also want to take transportation into account we do, when you're talking yeah. about right. housing we have, that further isolates. We have a bus route that runs along Route Nine, with a bus route that runs down. Uh, 47 to South Hadley, and that's it. Right. Bay Road, I think. Bay Road, Bay Road, Bay Road. Mm -hmm. yes. Well, you know, we got other. Actually, it turns into 40, yeah. In, in the past few conversations we've had a, at the past few board meetings, is we've got a couple million dollar issues here with the water and with the sewer. Mm -hmm. You know, and we need to take that into consideration because a project like this is going to be using both of them, you know. And yeah, we, what, yeah. what is the and capacity we, on the sewer plant? How much more could it take? Well, it's 30 years old now and it's due for an upgrade or we need to do some type of uh, expansion or <coughs> see if Amherst wanted to take a portion of the town to treat. You know, these are, these the quick fixes are over. These are, these are the next 20 or 30 years we need to discuss and we need to make some big decisions on. And, you know, we, we, I, I asked a couple of meetings if Pioneer Valley Planning ran into any of these these issues. Being a small town, I know they do it with Springfield and with a few of the bigger cities, but the water and sewer issues and regulations are, are killing this small town right now, you know? 
Well, I think, but, Chris, uh, we're at 90% capacity over the last few yes. months. Yes. And a lot uh, of that. Sewer water. Sewer. Sewer, okay. So, so and that's, yeah, anything that's added is a negative. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you know, especially if you start putting any kind of, you know, extra mm -hmm. additional load like that, the water would probably have a, a fair amount of capacity, well, they, but that's. Well, they cut one tank out of service. We're not using the Mount Warner wells, which they wanted a cap, which is not a very good idea because you're not going to be able to drill another well. So at some point, we're going to need to discuss whether we need to put another treatment plant at Mount Warner to treat the good water that we've been drinking for the last 50 or 60 years and continue uh, servicing those two units, you know. Yeah. And I guess that's the thing too with the sewer, just to tack onto a couple of conversations, is we could expand the treatment plant possibly if we knew there was more development because we might have to do a rehab anyway or think of other options. Well, but you may have to expand it anyway, but development, but, expanding, encouraging development with the idea of using it as a reason to expand is an absolute, okay. Does so it ask for development? To happen. Now, <laughs> yeah. now, now you've got a few extra dollars coming in for your sewer and water, and then in ten years from now you're building new schools because you just done, you just done something to your school yeah. capacity. Well, but so. that's well, the thing: is our school well, capacity is going, or our school right. population is going down. Yeah, and there's not right, enough right. housing you available for right. things. You're not, you start encouraging development, you can't control it. I, one one particular point we haven't addressed is. It's a noble gesture, there's no question about it. So zoning is that delicate balance between the rights of the landowner when their property is zoned and the rights of the individual that are living next to it. We're talking about, let's say, building a 40-unit complex for affordable housing. If we suggested, well, there's some room between Middle Street and West Street, I mean, if somebody ran on that platform, I don't think they would elect, get elected for dog catcher because people will come out and oppose it because it's going to be in my backyard. This is the critical issue that we face with the planning board all the time. For example, when they wanted to rezone the other side of the bike path for 55 and older housing, <coughs> the neighbors came out in force. And this, the, this is the difficult. The gesture is a noble one, granted. But you know the But the reality is such that if you want to put it in somebody's backyard or suggested where it's gonna go, then then that's when you run into problems. But you know you And the other thing I have one other uh, I, I didn't see in the master plan where affordable uh, units were even addressed. <laughs> Primary pur purpose is to maintain open space agricultural land. That is always number one in the response that people get. And would you agree that we're going to put this on good agricultural land? I would be opposed to it because certainly people need housing. They also need food. <coughs> and you're not going to grow a lot of food in Leverett, Shutesbury, or Goshen. So I think this is kind of perhaps my agenda in the open space agricultural land. But the neighborhood has to be kind of singled out. Where do you want to put this? Oh yeah. John, you had a comment. Yeah, I just, I don't know if, if you two have any quick answer for the water and sewer issues with the Pioneer Valley cleaning. Or? Oh. <laughs> quick answers? Uh. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we'd have to look into yeah. that and see uh, if we have okay. any staff that could address. Because I think what you're trying to gauge is how to help the town figure out increasing capacity that yeah I, I mean in 88 when we upgraded a plant from the original 1964 design there was a lot of federal money at that point and state money so is there any grant programs out there we're not a combined sewer so that's a big uh, that's a big issue with with getting money in the first place and in second place our ratings and our two million dollars in the bank keeps us from getting a lot of grant money also well, I think the, the return on investment is the issue. Are we going to spend $10 million to add capacity to a sewer plant and then, you know, generate $100,000 in, in new tax yes. revenue? I mean, yes. there's, it's never going to pay for itself. How many affordable so, units do we have, by the way? How many affordable units do we have? We have 2,200 housing units in town, 
285 qualify as mm -hmm. affordable. So I just brought up. So I'll that's uh, going to be the thirteen percent. I brought up the single room occupancy. But, you know, the nature of families has changed. You don't have families of, except for Bill Dwyer, five six people, five six kid, five six kids anymore. And we've got these houses along the Middle Street corridor. You got one for sale right here. Who used to live here? I mean, that thing could be converted to a single room occupancy. I bet you could put 10, 10, 10 units in there, and the, the cost would be minimal. Next to the church. Why not? I mean, well, no, that's the one that's I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah. The yeah. Excuse me? Yeah, the, the old parsonage. Yeah, and if there. you start looking at those types of options, maybe people don't want a big place. Maybe they want to live alone. You know, that would solve a and, problem. And that, would, that, would, that, yeah. that would get into the temp. Uh, we had this discussion with North Hadley. Oh, if we turn that into six or eight units that's, of this, is different. this is different no, this no, is different this is in the center I mean, of town people have yeah. access to transportation yeah and it's right there and you can convert it they're doing, they're doing it with the keaty house in amherst right now and it's going to happen something earlier i had a question about did you say that for every 10 units in a subdivision one has to be affordable is that actually a requirement yes yes well, something like that what was the question for every 10 units in a subdivision one has to be affordable yes correct yes that's we have, yeah, so we got an inclusionary. We got an inclusionary bylaw. Yes, mm -hmm. that is the inclusionary zoning. But, mm -hmm. <clears throat> but that, there's there only was, there's only been one subdivision that has been subject to that. So yeah. we've only added one unit. People aren't coming in for larger subdivisions yeah. in general. You're saying because no, we have so much protected land as well. There. Yeah. We also have mm -hmm. a number of subdivisions that are not built out yet. So we have a lot of inventory mm -hmm. of building lots. Yeah. So I um, just want to support what Mike is saying. Um, I I think you know again what the point I was trying to make, and I know this is only this is just one topic that that we have here um, on the agenda. Yeah. But how do how do we move forward? And I think you know where Mike and I might be in alignment on our thinking is rather than waiting, changing the zoning and then wait and see who comes in as a result of that zoning change would be to be more targeted and proactive and say let's take an inventory and take a look at the areas of town that you've identified that might be a logical place to enhance our low-income housing certainly along route 9 is obvious and we have natural barriers with that bike path running along one side i mean to get to joe's point about yeah there are a lot of people who don't want to see something crop up in their backyard on open farmland but we have a you know and they're all private private ownership. I mean, so we're not going to go eminent domain knocking somebody out, but maybe there's somebody with an existing home that they're yeah, interested in. You know, in if this were Northampton, this house over here would be turned into four apartments, mm -hmm. okay? You can't do that in Hadley. Okay. Right. Northampton has the SRO going in and um, right on the bend there as well that uh, CDC is putting in. So the, We have this pile of money to do something in that vein, but the, the Affordable Housing Trust Fund is almost impossibly difficult for a small town to manipulate and to control. That's where I think Pioneer Valley could come in. If they could be the conduit or have a division so they could manage it and keep track of it, that would be a possibility. Mm -hmm. So I'm just coming back yeah. to the question, how, how do we how do we move the ball forward in terms of this discussion? Can I just add one other thing is, um, one thing that I discovered is that community preservation funds can be used to prolong the affordability of existing affordable units. Very good point. So there are, and I don't know exactly how it works, but so it's possible that some of the units that you're saying are eventually going, uh, are reaching the end of their time limit could be extended. And Amherst, Amherst went through that exercise. Yeah, I think we discussed that Rolling with, uh, Green. with uh, Green. Yeah. How, how many are falling off in the next five or 10 years? In the next five years, there's 20, I think it's 27 or 22 falling off. Those are the ones by Stop and Shop. Yeah, I think then, we had a discussion about I think that, in, to in, that. I want to say in eight extended. years, something like that, there is a number falling off at Winfield. And so, the rest at Winfield are in perpetuity. So what about maybe focusing our efforts on identifying, you know, adding maybe one SRO or something like that 
a year going forward in the areas like on Route 9, on Bay Road, the areas that already have sewer and, and, and our possibilities with transportation. And in the meantime, we focus on CPA money and the housing trust money or whatever you want to call it and extending the existing units that we have to kind of make sure that we're set for the future and then and take that incremental step of you know adding one a year or something like that. And the other issue is that you know, this is the historical district and so not too much could do to be done to the outside of the house so we'll probably maintain the character of the neighborhood right. if you were doing it here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Does the state have any plans to do any projects like Burke Way again? There's no like unless it depends where they get the land. There's no large so I, I completely agree. I think we need more baseline information. Uh, we have some anecdotal, uh, but I think we need more baseline uh, to make a plan. Yeah. Mike makes a good point on just just not particularly this this house, but for just I use the house as an example. But in general, okay, rehab that house. Great idea. How? Okay, so you know, who does it? Is it? Do, do we hire a developer? Do we en en enlist a developer? Do we? You know, I think this is something that Pioneer Valley could give us some direction on if we were to do that. Well, clearly, every, you had ten units in there. Clearly, everybody couldn't have a car. <laughs> how did, how did, can I ask? How did Shady Lawn get to be so many apartments in there? That was a variance from the CBA. So the variance is functionally legal spot zoning. Mm -hmm. uh, the proposal was made to put the number of apartments in there. The ZBA had a public hearing. The neighbors were convinced that this would be the best solution for a white elephant that was peeling in front of them. Mm -hmm. And so uh, the variance was issued. It was not, not appealed. So it became the same thing with the Ben Smith Tavern. Uh, that is only two units. It is. Big units. Big units, but uh, <laughs> that was two units. The zoning bylaw does allow conversion of a structure existing in 1962 into two units by special permit from the ZBA. Yeah. Not a variance. Not, Not a variance. A variance. Okay. Um, and that might be another route. As Mike said, the, the large houses in Northampton are being cut up into condos. Mm -hmm. And uh, if we perhaps mm -hmm. allowed, say, um, instead of saying two units, um, allow units of no less than, say, a thousand square feet, maybe some of the large structures could be subdivided, subdivided mm -hmm. internally, condoized, mm -hmm. and that deals with a couple of things. It might not necessarily deal with the affordability, although maybe it would in some places, but it would also deal with the the middle income housing stock. Um, yeah. If we so that's another thing we could look at. And we might take that up under our separate contract with the planning commission uh, for technical assistance. Uh, but something like uh, anything an existing structure be, can be converted into up to four units. Yeah. We have to remember too that we do have an upwardly mobile society. My family is a case in point. We grew up on a farm in North Avenue. You pick cucumbers for a living, okay? And uh, these SROs could be a starting point for some somebody to live just out of college. And it, yeah. It's not going to be permanent. It's not going to be permanent. The need's always going to be there. Sure. Yeah. But it doesn't have. It's not going. I, I hope they don't want to live there forever. So on this conversation, I guess. Do you guys have something additional to add, or guys, I'd just like to wrap well, up this I, portion. Somebody was Maybe. asking about. Go ahead. You, you, I'm sorry. Yeah, uh, just a couple of comments. Um, Amherst tends to uh, mix their low income or moderate income housing amongst their regular market rate uh, housing, and I think that makes a better mix because then you're not isolating these low income people in one particular building or area. building for low income. I think we really need to uh, let these developers or make these developers do it as they go. Um, Barry's development in particular, uh, just because that's come up, 
Um, there's no reason there could have could not have been a low income house in that, other than it wasn't affordable for him to build it that way. Um, so, you know, and I know Barry. I, you know, he's a great guy. I love working with him. He's great with his projects. But this is just an example of this is a danger that we may get into. Uh, I'd be concerned about that. Well, yeah, um, yes, and the other part, I'm not done yet. Oh, sorry. The other part of, about this is what it costs to build a house today is going to be different than in 10 years from now. So you're not going to be able to build that same house for this uh, moderate to low income family um, as easily. You're going to have part of a house. Um, and in regards to the SROs, um, Amherst only has basically one building that I'm aware of right now because they provide low and medium income uh, housing amongst their regular developers. So there's no need to be concerned about the SROs. If we write our um, bylaws correctly, we shouldn't have an issue with it. So let's look at that carefully. But the other part of this is, and it's, my son has brought this up as well, um, we need housing stock in town that young people can afford to live in before you're never going to get them back in town. Yeah. The only people that can afford to live here are the people that exist here or have family land here and can yep. sell it to their kids. So if we don't start planning for that, we're going to lose a very important part of the population and you're not going to have young families and you're not going to have kids going to school. And we're going to have a problem with the school because it's not going to be occupied. It won't be as fully occupied as it needs to be. So we need to consider this. I think we should go back to thinking about it. Route 9 is a perfect example of where we could be putting this. I, I kind of disagree with that last statement. Housing and businesses do not mix well. It's Anytime you have a house, <laughs> housing or a single house and you propose a new building or mall or any kind of store, the people will come out against it. Whether it's the, uh, let's take Lowe's for example. One person held that whole development up for probably nine months as hostage because didn't like something with the uh, Lowe's development. But Joe, all over the country, mixed use development is absolutely the way to go. That's where I, all of the new I, housing I stock is. I kind of disagree. I mean, we have. All you have to do is drive it, around the state it, or anywhere. It, <laughs> called a downtown too. I mean, yeah. that's well, been happening for a century. Well, we'll, we'll not, you know, Allie's a good not test. Have a downtown. A good no, test I'm case. saying that. I'm not We're saying. We're not going to resolve it, yeah. but a good test case is downtown Amherst. Let's see who's going to live in those apart those uh, high rises. They're high full. rises with no parking. They're already sold out. Yeah, they're, they're already they're all sold, sold out. Mm -hmm. Yes, but who's going to live there? We, we got to find out. Okay, so people are asking the question: okay. What what uh, developments are going to go offline? Okay, you've got number one uh, in perpetuity of 12 units, 40 units in perpetuity, Mountain View Apartments, uh, 23, 25 units are coming off. Next one, 80 units in perpetuity. Next one, 80 units <coughs> and 32. And then 27 in perpetuity. So, uh, there are some going to be coming off, but the, there's a lot of them there that are in perpetuity. So, so I don't know if anybody's ridden around Amherst for housing enough for these but it's it's yeah. like a ghetto. Okay. So, so oh. may, maybe the issue is yeah. that it's more than just so, get affordable get housing. Exactly. Maybe it is housing alternatives. That was in the yeah. master plan. Right. Yeah. And that might be. Uh, Maybe if we have a baseline of how much at risk we are from units coming off, um, then maybe we will focus more on the, the the middle range, the mid range. Maybe the condoizing of appropriate large large existing dwellings into two, three, four condos, uh, which would deal with your concerns. I think. And Tim, you had one last thing. The um, the one thing that we have now for our bylaw is uh, conversion to two family for existing to single family. That we also have to bring in the police on that because what we'll see from from their discussions is these student stuffers when you get these large houses and turn them into two units with four and five bedrooms each. The students are the ones that. Uh, 
will be in those, and they're problematic for them. If we do change our bylaws in, in a way to allow single bedroom apartments or whatever way we want to see them, <coughs> that's going to be a little bit better for all of us um, because you're not getting the student stuffers in there. It, it creates single units that um, maybe a couple will want. The high-end units were uh, one of the possibilities for the North Hadley home. Uh, yeah, our bylaw doesn't permit it, but we do need the high-end apartments for the young professionals to start off here. And that's, that's the one that certainly would be very advantageous. And you can do that in a mixed use, a mixed um, use type of building downtown. It can be small shops on the first floor with some nice apartments above. Some, of, the, some of these old houses down Route 9, all the proprietors had their businesses downstairs and they lived upstairs yes. yeah. for years and sure. years. Yeah. And efficiency so, apartments do work in New York City. Yeah. They, you know, 600 feet. Okay. So do you guys from PVPC have enough information to kind of get where we're at and what mm -hmm. we might be looking for and be able to put something together? Yeah, I mean, I think we can take it in steps and, mm -hmm. you know, take what you're telling us now and then come back with some thoughts and ideas and then do more back and forth and... Yeah. Yeah, we'll probably have to schedule some sort of progress meeting. The, the funding is until the end of the year. Okay. Mm -hmm. So... Is until the end yeah, of the year. Yeah, is until the end of the year. So would there be a good time to s kind of set a time at this point, like two months, three months? You want to get back to us? I just yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, just to so we can yeah. set a goal, I mean, maybe. Yeah, target. I mean, you have regular meetings at the planning board anyway. It's something that the select board could just <coughs> sit in on when they have it. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, we, we know do it's a joint up. meeting like that again, yeah, like this happy. again. So do you want to try one more topic? Yeah, I was gonna. I think this might lend itself toward looking at the plan, a plan, planning for a planner. Um, and, you know, it just seems like an area. Maybe if we had a person that was full time, could look at some of these issues and delve into them a little bit more. Um, but I don't know your thoughts on that, or you know, I'd love to your, see next year's budget. Your kind of what your plans are as a board moving forward, and how that could be integrated into your board. Well, where we are now, I'll yeah. kind of explain how we got there. The Long Range Planning Committee, number one, uh, there were some people that were proposing a planner, mm -hmm. and, and the compromise that came out was to use Pioneer Valley as needed, save the town a lot of money, and still our, offer s citizen participation, mm -hmm. five people participating as citizens. The problem I have with a full-time planner, whether it's Amherst or Northampton, they control what is done. For example, if you want to put a development in Northampton or any business, Wade and Fighten would ask you to contribute some money for 40 acres of Fitzgerald Lake, something like that. They have their own agenda, whereas five people, we have different agendas. We don't always agree on everything. And mm -hmm. I think the participation with citizen soldiers is probably the, still the best way. In Pioneer Valley, we started out using them. Now, how many towns use you as needed? 15, 20? Four. How many? We only have, we have four. That's that all? Use, that use us for a planning board assistance. So. so no, but for other things. Well, yeah, I mean, yes. we, I mean, we do other projects for them that are not necessarily related to the actions of the planning board, but yeah. We have um, 43 cities and towns yeah. in our region and we do well, work with most of them in so, some way or other. Okay, uh, so, <laughs> so one of the okay. unsettled points is who, the, who a planner would report to. Mm -hmm. uh, so in Amherst or Northampton, the planning boards are appointed, they're not elected and uh, they're appointed by the select board, as are the planning directors. And uh, there's sort of a parallel structure there. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a statutory authority for the planning board, but the 
a lot of what comes to the planning board is, as Joe was saying, is filtered through the planning department. Mm -hmm. So if the planning department says, no, don't bring that to the planning board, the planning board never sees it. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a threshold question that, that we really haven't discussed. Um, I think there is need for some level of uh, more assistance. Whether it is a full-time planner um, or not, I'm not sure we are there yet. Could it be um, a part-time planner? Well, you know, I, I don't know what the market is. And I know we did speak about the wage classification study, about maybe developing a job description for a planning director, mm -hmm. um, which might be something that we'll get to someday. <laughs> um, right now, uh, the Conservation Commission has a part-time assistant. Mm -hmm. um, and Janice does not, I think, have all the authority that, let's say, a planning director would have. But she is, uh, she's an in-house support in a way that you know we don't get from Pioneer Valley Planning Commission. We get bigger picture ideas, but we're not getting our phones answered, our uh, decisions drafted, our minutes printed. Uh, so I think there may be an opportunity to start a little smaller and not go. So more like an assistant rather than a more like planner. an assistant and pro probably it should be an assistant under the direction of the planning board uh, i know there have been some proposals to share services within town hall but at some point you get to the fact that this is a very specific area and you really have to know the rules and it's it doesn't really lend itself to oh i you know yes yeah, sometimes you need help stuffing envelopes uh, other times you need help uh, writing the legal notice to go in the newspaper and getting the public, getting the letters out to the right of butters. Or being informed when you're answering questions from the public yes. when they're calling. Right. Yeah. But you know, yeah. the, one of the big problems is that Bill Dwyer, Jimmy Maximowski, and Joe Zagrana combined have institutional knowledge of over 100 years. Yeah. yeah. And, and, yeah. and that's both a benefit and a drawback. And you know, last yes. night, I don't know if you saw the meeting last night, it wasn't being uh, filmed for a while, but somebody came in, they wanted to do an accessory to, uh, apartment, and Jim said, here, you need a form, and he opened his briefcase up and there was the form. Okay, that that's where the planning board office is, in his briefcase. <laughs> I don't know how much longer that can go on. But. Yeah. I was going to say, I would, yeah. and I would contend that's impressive. part of the issue. That's part of the issue where I think we need to start planning for what yeah. what can we do. Yeah. I'm, I'm agreeing with Bill. I don't think we need a full-time plan. I think we need something along an assistant that will almost like a, a modified secretary in a way that can take notes at the meetings, do exactly what Bill was saying, and answer a few basic questions and know what their limits are, no, I can't answer that. You need to come to the board for that. You need the board's opinion. I can't give you an answer on that. Mm -hmm. um, uh, well, the only counter to that, or thing I would add to that is, and I'm not married to whether it's a full-time planner or an assistant or something in between to start, but I think from what I've heard from all of you is, you know, again, you're elected, you have day jobs or, you know, you, you have other things that you're doing, and to be proactive, to stay on top of what's going on at the state level, all of the programs that are coming out. I mean, we all get emails, but for, I mean, we get inundated with them. I, I can't read every single thing that comes across to the select board, and I, and I have to assume that, that you guys don't either. And I know at least a couple of you have shared your frustration about getting so bogged down in some of these um, issues that have come up that it's prohibited you from having any time on your agendas that are true planning. Like to sit and look and say, hey, what should we be doing about this topic? Because you're still behind on, you know, having to catch up on marijuana, MS4, all of these other things. Well, the, so I think the idea of having the, the, the administrative support, I mean, I would argue for somebody who is truly educated to be a professional planner, whether See, that's on a part-time or full-time basis. That scares the hell out of me, having oh, a, a, somebody that's educated to be a professional planner. you got a professional bureaucrat. Mm -hmm. they gonna, they think they know what's right, and they don't know what's right. They only think they do. But experience, why experience, experience lets you, lets you, let, let you 
determine what's right. Not being educated in that particular field. I'm sorry. Here, I just have a couple of questions behind you. You can be your first. Uh, just a point of clarification. I'm an employee of the town of Amherst. I work in the same office as the planning office. Mm -hmm. There are four planners. They are there only to assist. They don't decide which projects go to the planning board. They help write the bylaws. Um, that usually in the past it went to the town meeting to be voted on just like it happens in Hadley now so the town decided what happens with their bylaws um, but there's one person that works on grants that's all they do they spend full time working on that there's another person that assists with all, with all of the zoning that goes through the office they're there every um, the zoning meeting so they take notes they write the minutes they do the decisions but that's what the planner does so there's different jobs that the planners can do we have another one that uh, actually just assists wherever it's necessary. Um, but I wouldn't be afraid of hiring a planner because they're going to tell you what to do. They're only going to assist you. They're going to do, they may bring new ideas, which you're not used to seeing, um, but they will also help you write these bylaws that we're talking about. And they're going to do it based on what they see in other towns and their other colleagues. So it's a good resource. So What's the planning budget in Amherst? Ask that question. I don't know what that is, Ours but $1, every much? hold on, hold on. Yeah. Everything that comes to our office goes to the planning board. They don't decide what's going to happen. It's all based on what the, the bylaws are in town. So if Hadley has some good bylaws, they shouldn't have to worry. What do you think would have happened if I could ask the question? If uh, Five Colleges Inc. had come before the uh, planner in Amherst and said, "I want to put a." Uh, Eighty thousand dollar foot warehouse in uh, the backyard of, of these people. Do you think the planner would have said, "Go ahead and do it"? But Mike, because, be, because it would have gone to the planning board and they would have yeah. decided what you guys did. Yeah. It's, it's the, no you different. You guys decide. The planning the planner does the not help. decide that. We need the help during the daytime and get through all these. We're getting so. away. I, I think I think this is under the planning board's purview of what you feel would be good for you to have, and I think I would leave it at your discretion. <laughs> on whether or not you want to start with a half-time help or planner or whatever you want to call the person, administrative assistant, um, with some knowledge of planning and have you make that decision on what you need for your department. Yeah, I think we'd like to explore some of the options. I think um, so too. I think that we are not ready to go for a, a full-time body because the, the what that person would do it is undefined. Mm -hmm. And uh, last night we were twirling our thumbs there, okay? Because you didn't have anything to do? No, we weren't. <laughs> well, <laughs> we were busy for an hour and a half. Wow. Well, yeah. Nobody knew what we were I'm going to leave and you stay here and take my place. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we, Linda, do you have one thing? Seen we did have yeah. one of those individuals that was a CETA employee uh, when I was the chairman. Here, we and go. Linda's got a comment here, real quick. Let's let her go ahead, real quick. I'm sorry. Okay, uh, some of this, some of what you, the concerns that you're raising are very same concerns that came up when the select board was deciding whether they would have an administrator, which is what they called an administrative assistant at that time. Now the planning board, now, now the select board is overwhelmed with the work that they have to do, and so is the administrator. This is the direction that we're going in, is that there's going to be more and more work, and less and less experience to do that work, Joe, because you guys sitting here now have it. But you've got to set this up for five years from now, ten years from now, whatever Four you years. want to do, whatever makes you uncomfortable. <laughs> you, the policy is still set by the select board. Right. Mm -hmm. And those policies would still be set by you. And if it's planning board's policy to say that we want to see all the projects that come before and we want to vote on them, so be it. But then you still have someone who's actually doing all the work, such as opinions and minutes and things that I see and have seen for the last three decades being done evenings and weekends at home and at, uh, at private business. This has to change going forward, that there's got to be someone to take on the work of the planning board and still have the planning board be the policy makers and decision makers. That can work. I kind yeah. of misunderstood that the planning board was still going to be it's important. Yeah. 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 Okay. Okay. No, well, I would definitely be against not uh, <laughs> the planning board. I was going to say we had on our views in five minutes. Sure, yeah, yeah, we could do that. Yeah, yeah, we can hit on our bees. Um, uh, planning board. Planning board, yeah. I mean, there. you guys were at the 
was it it wasn't MEMA, it was uh C what? C C E M A or C M A, something like that. Yeah. Yeah, that there, meeting. Yeah, that's you I know what you're talking about. Where it was brought up yeah. that, you know, it argues by the river could be yes, a possible right. liability, you know, in the event of a flood or something like that. Um, and, and Tim's brought this up too and probably could speak to it better than, than I, but I think just looking at that permitting process of those RVs and changing the bylaw for that permitting process might be something we can look at. And Tim, can you explain it a little better than I can explain it right so now? So certainly, we've, the history behind our permitting has been back and forth between two departments, and back and forth between zoning and planning. It is now in planning. So what I'm supposed to be enforcing this, and of, of course what we're seeing is the complexity of the, the permitting process has created it, uh, people just saying, that, hey with it, they don't want to deal with the permitting process. Let's just see what we can get away with. And what I get back from a lot of people is, the problem with our bylaw is that we only allow one RV unit per lot. These people want to go down there, enjoy their lots with their friends. What I'd, I'd really like to see is a permitting process like the, the um, select board has, where, where it's an easier process to go through, and, it, and throughout the years, if there's no problems, it's automatically renewed. If there's a problem, then, then there can be a hearing, just like you do with everything else. But this, our, our, we've had one major lawsuit and appeal with regard to RVs that took a tremendous amount of dollars from this town and many, many years to finally get resolved. What was the, the, the ultimate problem associated and why did that person appeal? Because he wanted more than one mobile unit down there. And I think we really have to look <coughs> at what the issues are down on the uh, Riverfront and how people want to use their properties. And I think we can make a better bylaw that allows people to use these properties for multiple uh, trailers in a much better way and a, an easier um, permitting process. And it, it's the gamut of several boards with, with the uh, no matter, what, health and everybody no matter what they have for trailers along the river, it has to be environmental safe, and they're not discharging their waste and their gray water into the river. Yes. Yeah. So, are and all that's where the Board of Health has to be part well, of. Well, is that what's happening now? Do they all have their sanding cans down there, and they're they're not using their um, well? The unfortunate their problem right now is the the sanding cans are not permitted to the RVs. It's permitted through the. Uh, um, the, right. Well, it's permitted by the company that that um, re that has the uh, Santa cans, and that's been the real problem. So we can't put the, the Santa cans associated with the RVs. Absolutely, uh, you can. That should be part of the permitting yes, process. It, it, yes, it's it part of the permitting yes. process. A little bit of history. This same conversation came up about 15 years ago. We want more trailers, and. The compromise was one trailer per lot, and even that was very controversial. Only passed the town meeting in a, by one vote. And now you have to have a special permit because there are FEMA regulations that are mm -hmm. on top of this. We are not supposed to have any of these in, in, in a flood way. That is right next to the river. If we want to be qualified for the FEMA uh, you know, loans and insurance, et cetera. Yeah. So going it's back even further, there was no authority for these RVs. There, there was no, so our bylaw is written, if it's not allowed, it's prohibited. So there was no authority for an RV by the river. The bylaw was created to grant authority for the RVs by the river. I guess my question is, so if, if I have land by the river and I want to go bring my camper down there for a month, 
two weeks, whatever. Can't. Why? Why is that an issue? Why is that a FEMA issue? I, I don't well, it's how it's, it is. it's it's a FEMA issue because yeah. we belong to the Federal Flood Insurance Management Program, and it's in the flood and, plain. And FEMA will not allow it because it's they're going to float down the river. Right. Well, no, it's yeah. not that they won't allow it. You have to have a bylaw to. We, we do have a bylaw. All you have to do is go before the Zoning Board of Appeals and you have to say that you'll have the trailer in uh, after May and out before October. Right. And, you, and all you, you get the special permit, it's granted. So it, it exists. I don't understand why it's an issue. And if we want to add more, if you want to bring two of your friends and have their trailers down there, so why not? Make it a seamless permitting process and be done with it rather than you know, make people skirt around the process and, and, and violate the, the, the bylaw. Well, how many, people, how many trailers do you want along the Connecticut River? Let's, uh, people from Chicopee, Hoyo, Hatfield, Hatfield doesn't allow uh, these RVs along the river. Hatfield people are in Hadley. Right. And Hoyo people are in Hadley, Northampton people in Hadley. So do you want to have, right now we probably have 200 campers along the river. You want to have 400, 500? You will have that many. So there was I think so that's, that's what we're trying to say, though, another, is we need to look at that yeah. bylaw to see how it's written. So, so another policy. Have it what is in place? We, we have an enforcement burden from this, right. but with yeah. no corresponding tax revenue from this. Well, yeah, and if we can make the process easier, we can generate more revenue by issuing more permits and, and kind of pay for that enforcement efforts and at the same time let people use their land the way they want to use their land. This is going to be an eye opener for everybody. Under FEMA regulations, campers are prohibited in RVs in the flood plain. This the is honey pot. The entire honey pot where most of the campers are is flood plain. They're going to be prohibited. Actually, I think it, yeah, it's from the man made dike out to the river. This is the dike. Yeah. All of this is flood plain. All this in Aquavita where there's all kinds of campers is flood plain. We will, these, all the campers in those areas, gone, okay? So a lot of the areas that people are using right now are going to no longer be available to do that. The people that have that land on there are gonna be some mighty upset landowners, and if we issue those permits, we could be, we will be in violation of FEMA, and we could lose certain grants, etc. But I thought that was clarification. Well, I thought that was clarification. I thought if it's flood plain, it's got to be removable within 24 hours or something like that. According to what we had a meeting yesterday and today with okay. with, with, with well. people that are in, with MS4 okay. and such, FEMA doesn't want this stuff in the, the flood plain or floodways, Joe? Floodway. Floodway. Flood flood way. Way. Okay, I'm sorry. Floodway. Yeah. The flood plain is different. Okay, flood but is flood, okay, it's so along the river. To be correct, but, but we, we got to so find out where well, you couldn't have anything. We, we got to find out where the floodway is. Yeah, yeah. So the floodway, nothing. Yeah. Right. The flood plain, easily removable. Right. Yeah. Because they don't want it traveling downstream. Yeah. So that's what we're talking about. Right? Yeah. 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 And flood right flood. now, this. So we have a bylaw. The bylaw is written to follow regulations that have come down from the state, which in turn is channeling FEMA. Yes, it is complicated, but that's what we've got to work with. So uh, unless there is a way to streamline the FEMA MEMA regulations, we don't have that option. You know, we, we, we have to conform to those, we have to conform to the regulations that are above us. We, we don't have a blank slate to draw our own. And the only issue on our bylaw that FEMA brought up is unfortunately we have the word flood plain in there and that, that is s so stipulated that you're not allowed to have flood plain and that was pretty simple, we just move, remove those words. The issue is what, why are we getting so many violators? The reason is we have such a very complicated permitting process. It's not and we have no way of knowing what's down there. And I agree with Mr. Phil that people want to just be able to go down there, put their trailer, when we go down there and see the number of trailers, there is probably right now 18 permitted 
tra trailer areas. But they want to have some friends there for the weekend. Why can't we have an easier way of doing this than the only one that I went after went to court and took us how many years to deal with this and all he wanted was three trailers down there from the very beginning. So this is what all I'm saying is can we just please look at the bylaw to make it a little easier for these very very large properties to have only up to three because if you have four or more it's a totally different regulation. It gets into state. All I want is we need to look at how this can be worked a little bit easier so people don't have to go through this whole procedure and this expense of getting their land surveyed so you guys can know that there's only one and, and I think one the, property. we're That's saying all too we is want. we're willing to use the select board resources to have that permitting process through the select board we could charge a fee it could be a little source of revenue we it might be smoother than we've going gone through, through the this CEA. before yeah. and it went to a town meeting before and there were other suits before the one that Tim is referring to Mitch and Marina said they were grandfathered in for seven and nine trailers must yeah. be 19 or yeah, yeah. 30 of them there yeah so people have just taken advantage of it and what came out of the bylaw was the special permit for one trailer per lot and so unfortunately that's and you all you have to do is go before the ZBA make sure you have some kind of uh, sanitary disposal and say you're going to remove it in time well, I so, so going to the ZBA sounds easy but in fact with posting requirements butter notification public hearing in frequency of meeting. Well, yeah. What, what, so, what, 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 what would a streamlined process be? Not notifying the butters. So you, is there is there some sort of way to make this faster, cheaper, better for okay. everybody? Right. This for the town yeah, for the, the current bylaw is based on the state model, and the state model is based on FEMA requirements. So. If someone wants to swim upstream and find a better way to comply with state law, that's fine. But we're, we didn't come up with this. Uh, we're not even talking about changing that section of the bylaw. Well, sure we're just sure looking, looking at an easier way of permitting. That's well, all. Well, well, the thing is, even the singletons well, out well, there well, aren't well, permitted. Well, what would be a better, easier permitting process, for example? There's a form you can download online. You apply with the select board. That property is pre-approved to have those How trailers How is it pre-approved? Maybe, yes, maybe it's historical sign-offs. Maybe it's the planning okay, board. Now, I, I don't know all the details. Okay. I'm a farmer. But, yeah. Somebody else, and I don't have front property, but I have a lot of property that is next to the riverfront. Mm -hmm. And now I'm no longer going to be notified when someone's going to put a camp and travel across my property to get to the riverfront. You're darn right. I want to know about it. Mm -hmm. Well, I think we can we can figure out a process, and maybe that's streamlined. But my issue is from a, a revenue standpoint. If you go to a commercial campground, you're paying between twenty-five and seventy-five dollars a night to stay there to put your camper there. So why not turn it into a way where we can generate revenue on a on a monthly, yearly, whatever basis, and get some more of these guys that are actually compliant? Uh, I, I, I'm not against any of that. I'm just saying to streamline the permitting process, you need to take everybody into effect into account not just that person who wants to put five trailers on their property. Right. Well Jimmy, what I think we do now with like the alcohol licensing or use of the town common, there's a form, but there's a checkoff process. So whatever that permitting process would be to be defined between inspections, board of health, planning board, we could make sure that it goes, you know, 
the boxes are checked and whatever needs to happen happens and then it just comes in here and we ask does anybody have an issue and yeah. we issue the permit okay but, but nobody's answered my question what's required you check off the boxes i don't any, i have no right. idea what you're talking and about. i think tim's suggesting what he would like to have that conversation yes. and collectively come up with a better way okay. and it might to address not be. the customer yeah. service yeah. issues or we throw yeah. up our hands and then we and throw up our hands and say no more trailers right. that's right. fine yeah. if, if we, we get rid of them all if we well what will fema tell us if we can well, comply, you were Christian. What, if, yeah, they, if if no, we can comply with the FEMA regs, we're liable. Yeah, yeah, okay. and, and streamline the permitting process, and still notify the appropriate people. We, you know, I'm, we're, we're willing to look at that, mm -hmm. but we need to, you know. And I, I would love to have, you know, not the planning board as EBA, somebody that you know do the permitting. That would be fine. Um, I, don't, I don't think the, the ultimate approver is that important as much as the process itself. We sent it over to the ZBA because they're they're used to handling smaller projects. They have a lighter workload, mm -hmm. so that's why they're the special permit granting authority. It's, it's got more to do with use of land than anything. So, yeah. so, so if I own a piece of property on the river, I've got room for three uh, trailers, campers. Can I put an ad in the Gazette and say for rent? Frontage on the river, two thousand dollars a month. No. Why? Why? Why are you going to do that? Why can't I? <laughs> it's my property. Why do you want them yeah. all on your property? Well, I, want to, I want to make some money. Oh Lord, help us. Yeah. I, know. I, know. I, I mean, can you do that right now? Can you do that right now? I think you no. probably can. No. no. Why not? No. No. Because no. you no. only allow one. Yeah. Well, so, my point is, I mean, can I rent my property? Would it be any different for someone now? to have one camper on my property? The yes. answer is yes. Yes, you can. I can charge whatever I want to. Yes. Yeah. That is true. Yeah. So if you allow three, I can. Uh, you can rent, rent three out. Yeah. We would leave it yeah. under that <laughs> circumstance. We would. Uh, Thank you for opening up that harness. Uh, that's one of the I want to point out to the audience. All right. To, to that quarter, point, quarter yeah, I think we're going to wrap this okay. up. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, I don't know where we end this conversation exactly, other than I, you know, we know it's an issue with FEMA, obviously, and if we can do anything to up update that well, we're, we're, bylaw or look into alternative permitting processes i think I, I don't think that i mean we'll get more information out of this forward we had a first meeting today about the ms4 update mm -hmm. um probably want to have a lot to ultimately i'm not sure how much it's going to have to do with the riverfront recreational vehicle but we'll have to wait and see what comes out of it yeah yeah we may have there are there are a lot of i guess that the takeaway is there's Possible changes that we'll have to implement, regardless anyway. of well, the whole issue. bunch of changes we'll yeah. have to implement. No doubt yeah. about that. Yeah. Um, how, how severe are they? We don't. We're not quite sure. Yeah. 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 What's yeah. the implementation date for the floodway rule? The well, the whole MS four takes effect June thirtieth. July first. Okay, apples and oranges. Yes. Floodway is FEMA. Right. MS four is right. EPA. Different, and, different topic. Um, yeah. So it's MS4 so implementation is the, the implementation is, is June 30, 2020, 2020. We're trying to have a bylaw. We're trying to have the MS4, whether it be zoning, general, this is going to be a combination of both, update, ready for the fall town meeting. Mm -hmm. So we basically have a year to get this together. Well, the MS4 but, we only have MS4, right? until November. Whatever that is. What's the feedback? MS4. 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 Well, They're still in the review. FEMA, yeah. No, yeah. FEMA's FEMA's regulations are set. Oh, oh yeah. uh, they are. The other thing they're doing, FEMA's doing two things. They have the regulations that now exist that say nothing in the floodway. They are doing a remapping project, right. which has a two to five year event horizon. Okay. That remapping project may change the parameters of the floodway and the flood yes. uh, plain. Mm -hmm. But the, the limitations in those areas are already set. Right. Yeah, but it's the mapping that's affecting us. Yeah, that is the we're breaking the rule now. So <laughs> this well, that was what we were told. Yeah. Yeah. Now yeah. that's something it's an we, issue. May, we may want to have town council chime in on that, or just go with the fact that. All right, we, we got for free. So thank you all for coming tonight yeah, to have this discussion range, with us. The kind of range that just, I, I really think we want to encourage farmers, or allow farmers, 
I know through this property drainage ditches pass to be able to make, maintain it themselves rather than town, the town taking that work done. I mean, Joseph Ryan just treads the ditches on his property. I think if a farmer has a ditch on their property, they should be able to clean it rather than the town going to do it, costing us. As the I guy said, I five million dollars. People were supposed to do. Yeah, I believe I they. Think, I believe they do have that right. But most of them are. Maybe we should encourage it. No, well, most of them are yes. doing. It's like that's, that's the proper it's, it's, like, yeah. it's like it's, it's like pumping out the uh, pot of pot pot of pot. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Do we, uh, since we had an appointment at 7.30, uh, Christopher would discuss water and sewer rates. Thank you for coming. Look forward to hearing from you. So Christopher, we are going to discuss, uh, discuss water and sewer rates. Uh, you know, we've been talking about this for a uh, few weeks. Last week we discussed possibly doing some things with restructuring some of the sewer debt. Yes. Um, different proposals. But um, I don't know if you've had a chance to kind of incorporate all that information we talked about and if we need to take any action on sewer rates at this point. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, we I have. And um, we've also. Um, we're waiting for the board to see the board that might have digested some of the proposals we presented to the board last week. Mm -hmm. So we haven't heard from the board if the board has been able to to look at those various proposals. And they, so that's where we are. So So last week the board talked about a couple of ways of approaching the uh, uh, sewer issue in terms of funding and future capital projects. Uh, your next uh, agenda item is a special town meeting warrant, a comparative draft warrant. Is those two uh, approaches incorporated into the into the articles, articles uh, three and four, if I remember correctly. So that's that's one thing that uh, so, so the board the board is ready to go with the two proposals that we well for, ta for town meeting warrant. Okay. Uh, one thing Mr. I was Chairman, I'm sorry. Uh, I was gonna say one thing I forgot that Molly you brought up is the issue of stabilization and um, transferring some of that. I, I assume you meant transferring some of that money to I guess. Replenish the sewer enterprise fund. I think I could bolster it. Yeah. You know, I mean, their their reserves. You know, we're very adamant about not wanting to spend down reserves. Um, certainly not for operating. But I think in this case, it's a <coughs> balance sheet realignment. I think we could explain that <coughs> to town meeting, and we could explain it to standard and course when they come in. Um, we're well over our our target for stabilization right now. Again, it's all part of the plan. We don't want to have it start slipping backwards. But if we did a one-time realignment and took whether it's you know 150,000 or something from that and, and um, just journaled that over to the sewer reserve, I'm pretty sure that has to go through a town meeting. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, so the two-thirds. Two-thirds. Yeah. So what about doing something like I was thinking two or three hundred thousand of that moving into into there, and then we have the you know we're gonna we put on there to take over the debt and interest payment of 126,000. Yes, 28. So that'll help rebuild that enterprise to some degree. Yes. And then the other one is look at the possibility of the CPA 1%. So I think all of those combined with maybe a slight increases over time to make up for the time we had mm -hmm. could prevent the 15% a year. That yeah, and maybe some yeah. creativity on Chris's part. There might be an opportunity just in a small way to reduce some of your operating as well. Right. So that we're hitting revenue, we're hitting operating, yes. and we're realigning the balance sheet. <coughs> okay. So is, is that something we could so do for uh, town meeting warrant why we're here tonight as far as uh, our one amount? What's a really thing we think for a month? Well, I think we we do want to protect stabilization. So uh, I don't remember off the top of my head how far above that target we are. I don't think we'd want to go dollar for dollar above that. But I think you know 150 to 200 range is maybe palatable. But we'd want to run it by finance as well. Mm -hmm. Just get their opinion. So we have the two suggestions on the warrant so far. 
this would be a third possibility. Mm -hmm. Okay. I mean, I think with those things, I don't know if we have to take a vote on any of us right now, but uh, we'll add it to the warrant. We would have to. Yeah. yeah, but I would let's let's put together the scenarios, mm -hmm. and then uh, when we're when we're preparing the warrant for Ernest, uh, we can can present you with numbers and different ways of uh, of um, making this happen. But the the sewer, if in fact we're going to talk about even a nominal increase in the sewer rate. That is time sensitive, right? Yes. So what's what's the time sensitivity in terms of getting that into the next possible billing cycle, right? Because we're always yeah. way in arrears. Sooner, the, sooner the better. Sooner the better. And that's where I kind of was trying to get to tonight: is do we need to vote on any kind of rate increase for sewer to not miss out on that billing period? Right. Um, you know. I don't think 15% is going to pass right now, but uh, no, you know, is the, there something in line with what we did with water that yeah. would be nominal? With the options that the board is looking at right now, they are very good options for us. So even if the board gives us 3% with these options, I think uh, it would be good for us. Mm -hmm. If we voted to an, do an increase tonight, when would that take effect? Because I know there's oh, a long lag we done. Uh, Hi. Hi. <laughs> Oh, it would take right. effect for the November 1st bill, right. so it would be the effect. second quarter of FY20 yep. would be when it would take effect. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. <laughs> I, I don't know, did That's you watch last week? All, all, all the, all the, I also have So that one, one point eight million that uh, Linda brought forward, mm -hmm. that, that's existing right now, debt. Yep. You wouldn't entertain any of that to be taken out of capital <coughs> or out of stabilization for a long term. This is only a temporary fix. We, you've got big problems here. We have big mm -hmm. problems here, John. Yeah. <laughs> no, <laughs> not mine. No, 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 no. <laughs> not me no, personally. No, 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 no. Before we create, we create, this board created this problem. We did not. This board created this problem with the DPW. It wasn't set up correctly. And there's still a lot of work to be done in the DPW. Mm -hmm. and, and finally, everybody's listening. <laughs> so so I we, think we, we are taking long, some of it, though. With uh, right. six. No, absolutely. But we need to look at longer term fixes here. Oh, I'm, I'm totally on board with you on that. Again, I'm not, but I don't think we're talking about that tonight. We're talking about what actions can we take right now. And then ultimately, yes. we, still, we still have an issue. Yeah. Um, so, you know, unfortunately, this is, it's an elegant Band-Aid, but it's still a Band-Aid. I think we all recognize that, mm -hmm. right? And then we have, we still have the question on the table of how do we deal with the long-term sewer? Yeah. I will tell you right now, I am in favor of water. talking to Amherst. I'm not, we don't have enough facts on the table. Yeah, I think exactly. we should be talking to Amherst. I, I think we should be looking at incrementally bringing maybe some additional uh, users online being conscious of the capacity we're at right now but those are much and, and all that can be taken issues. into consideration if Amherst is understood in, in mm -hmm. some kind of a deal I mean, you know a Pioneer Valley planning and I said it I know I said it for the past three or four years it really needs to get involved with this because it, it, it's affecting us us more than anybody and I'm sure it's hitting a lot of other small towns also you know, for their expansion. Right, so what do you want okay, to do? Okay, Mr. Chairman, so, yeah. we cashed this out long yeah. enough. Those are long term. If we can, if the board can make a decision on this mm -hmm. to solve this current issue, then we'll come before the board with other, including these other issues, which for long term resolutions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'll make a motion yeah. to increase sewer rates. You said three? Yeah, I said three percent based on. The other fact that the board wants to give to us, which that we have a lot, the taking from money from stabilization fund, and also the move of the current debt to, and then also the CPA uh, um, funding. I also will, I don't know the legal ramifications there, if we put it that the 1% is going to sue, as opposed to 
going to a particular fund mm -hmm. that Service Board can authorize us to use. Yeah, I think we have to we have to work the yes. details yes. of that out. You're right. You know, maybe even that CPA money yeah. would be used. We don't want to take it from our main stabilization. Yeah. Yeah. You can't use CPA for other purposes. No. That no, no, no. no, no, no. We no we change so, but so people are you perceiving this as you're talking mm -hmm. about it. Right. So no, no. CPA right. is CPA. No, we're looking yeah. to deduct. Deduct. Three percent. We're taking that away, I making it two, and taking one percent. I understand. And putting it towards. But we said that last week, so. Yeah. No, Linda's just. So yeah. we need to be careful how we say things because right. people don't yeah. necessarily translate. So yes. we're talking about they still don't future funds. Future, future funds, funds, and we're, we're talking, talking about reducing, about reducing CPA, one part and one, and then you're talking about increasing something, and yeah. then telling people you're coming out the same, right. but you're yeah. not using CPA funds for sure. Correct. Correct. Okay, right. Molly made a motion to yeah. um, so increase your rates. To so I'll, I'll second for discussion. Okay. okay. Thank you. Uh, yeah, that one percent you're talking about though is not going to be state backed anymore though, so it's strictly from the town. So right. we, we you're not going to have as much money coming in. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, but if we if we designated it towards capital, towards the water lines, towards the sewer yeah. lines, towards the sewer plant. But it's only half the value. Uh, no, no, I understand. But okay. that progress will be in in the ground, uh, on the ground. You know, we're, we're getting There's something out of it. Better than nothing. So my concern with the raise and yeah, the rates or an, an increase of, of the rates at this point is if we are to raise rates tonight even 15%, but yet none of these items that we're potentially looking at on the town meeting warrant pass, we still don't have a solution because we can raise the rates 50% right. or 100% and yeah. we'd still be in the same problem. Yeah. So then my other issue is if these things pass and we get all three of them on the town meeting more if we rebuild back up the enterprise fund then you know maybe we're looking at increasing things too much maybe that 10 percent we're looking at or that three percent doesn't need to happen necessarily right away so uh, oh i think the three I, I would think the three percent, percent yeah. would be a good, a good thing because uh, i think we are too aggressive with the charge backs ourselves i, I think like with the charge backs well, that to I need to make a clarification. Yeah, go ahead. I was under the impression that the rates were already discussed for increase. I did not realize that they have not been voted. So Only tonight, water. water was voted. Water was, vote, water was voted, but yes. not sewer. Right. Okay, Correct. so the sewer vote you're discussing tonight, Correct. that would not have taken effect until the February billing cycle. Okay, so oh, okay. we missed November and we're on to February. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Because we are already, safe. that's why I was, I just wanted to clarify that. Thank you. That yeah. um, with the sewer increase tonight, obviously they're already in the cycle currently mm -hmm. that is for our november billing yeah. so any increases tonight would not be in effect until our collections for february which is our third quarter of fy20 so what would be the cutoff date for voting on an increase to still hit that february billing point where, where how, how we would have had to you would have had to have made a decision regarding the increase for the sewer prior to the middle of may no, it would be for November. You got it. He's saying, what's the drop dead for the February? Oh, the drop dead for the February. Yeah. Um, the next time they'll be reading will be approximately the middle of August. So it does give you a little bit of a, of a cushion, but obviously. Yeah, I mean, it still doesn't hit town meeting. I mean, right. Yeah, exactly. it doesn't fall there. And exactly. I kind of like to get this off of our agenda because it has been on it for the past yes. three meetings. So I would like to. <laughs> So get what, get what, what stabilization it. are you talking about and taking money out for sewer? Well, right now we're just the, the motion on the table is just right. raising but sewer rates. I, for my discussion, I want to know what stabilization are you looking at? The stabilization. The, 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 the town the stabilization fund of two point two million. million. Two, yeah, about two million. Over two million. So that we're not take we're not going to take it. So it's going to go below two, correct? Well, we have a. Ooh, I don't know exactly what it is right yeah, now. Yeah, and that's yeah. why I'm saying we yeah. want to look at the numbers. Yes. Yeah. I mean. I don't think there's anything so magic about the number two. It's more the stabilization relative to our operating budget. <clears throat> like how to me two was the number not to go below. That's but our, our operating mind. expenses keep going up. So I we know. were looking to target it as a percentage of our total budget. Yeah. And so well, that was a policy two. that we put in place, right? What's our policy? So we don't go below two. Ten per yeah, we have a ten percent policy, so I think that's it's one point. It's 1.8. And 1.8 1. 1. 1. something would be yeah. the policy, but I, I, I don't want to bring it down too much, but enough to give them a shot in the air. To help a little bit. Two questions. So, what does the 3% amount to as revenue for the DPW, and how will that be used? It won't be 3%, 3%. it'll be 1%. 1%. 1%. 1%. 1%. 1%. 1%. 1%. 1%. 1%. 1%. 1%. 1%. 1%. 1%. 1%. 1%. 1%. 1%. 1
Well, no, you just said about three oh, percent raise in our sewer rate. Oh, so, well, how much money will that generate, that and where will that be, or how will, will it be used? Uh, we uh, we uh, the money we use for capital projects. Right now, we have we have a lot of capital projects. So we use, so it will not be used for operating funds. Is uh, that for just regular maintenance, or what do you mean by capital projects? Um, we have uh, we have um, our collection collecting systems needs to be fixed. Uh, many of them, currently right now, we we have not, again, part of it is maintenance, part of it is maybe re um, replacing the structure or including uh, putting in what we call slips. Um, mm -hmm. So we currently have just started looking at the uh, lines, our uh, collision systems. We also <coughs> have... Uh, I don't know what happened today. Yesterday we did about yes. 2,500 feet and we need yes. to sleeve line about 1,500 feet roughly, 1,800 yes. feet. Just about what we did over on Route 9, so we're looking at about $80,000 right there to fix the main line going down Middle Street. I don't know what happened today. I was not there. No, I, yeah, I've not received that today's report. So, uh, so, and we also, and that just a fraction of what we're supposed to do. Is that you line clear large enough? Is clear what the lining is? What yeah, I'm, okay. I'm sure yeah. I'm clear with that. Uh, is that middle street line large enough for the future? By lining it, you're going to make it smaller? No. Uh, no. It's, we have a, it's a big system. It's like, it's okay, it's yes. big enough? Yes. Okay. So do we have a number of what the 3% amounts to? The 3% uh, the amount we're looking at, if we add, with, we're looking at about, we change from 15% we are asking for the three percent, so we're talking about uh, anywhere from. Um, Hold on, one. David. I think I get based on my information. Yeah. Maybe yes. he has a better number than me. So I don't know what the revenue is. It's one fifth of what, so whatever the. So an additional thirty thirty six five. Yes. Thirty six thousand five hundred. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so oh, I want to give it thirty seven. So here, yeah. right. not a lot. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's half the line, half the line on Middle Street lining it. So I don't think that's yeah. Is, is that quarterly or is that annual? It's annual. These are other numbers. Okay. If these are for capital projects, Correct. why don't we just put it on town meeting like we do other capital right. projects? That's like when I'm we have a water main and we need to replace it, and we put several hundred thousand dollars. So in I just said it. And then this time have it paid by taxation instead of sewer fees. Put 2,000 feet of water replacement, put 2,000 feet of sewer lining or replacement every year in the capital and have the taxation pay for I've been saying right, right or, or just put it, or just put it yeah, on for some like we we're still gonna put it as a capital project but the money has to come from enterprise funds. And but if it is no, it unless the town decides unless the town decides otherwise unless the town correct. decides they're sure. gonna take it which out is what the they did with the with the Calhoun Wells. The town yeah. decided we're gonna pay half of it out of yes. taxation, we're gonna sure. pay half of it out of water. So why don't we to balance out the water the sewer debt, especially if you're talking about taking it from that's what, CPA that's what and from that's what, that's what the stabilization. Town, that's what about right now. Pay it out of taxation, but do it as an override in the fall, just like it, it so I think we've got to be paid out of taxation. Yeah. I, I think we have multiple issues going on. The town warrant. Yeah. We we need fall. to have enough operating revenue coming in yeah, to offset operating okay. expenses. Okay. So what we're so the doing to poor Chris tonight is we're trying to ask him to take these little pockets of money and tell you exactly match yeah. fund what we're talking about. We're talking about just keeping the operating revenue increasing at three percent, which is consumer you know, basically the CPI, nothing else, because we're slipping backwards. Yeah. Period. Regardless of capital projects, we're going in the wrong direction. So okay. I would just say the three percent is a rate increase. It goes into the coffers. Yeah. Versus a, as the director will manage the funds accordingly. And, and it increments the steps up, so we don't end up in a position where we need to raise it fifteen percent right. because we haven't raised it. So part of the operating budget is paying for past debt. Yeah, and, and again, so, yeah. so, so that's we that still yeah. and we still have to that. treat that in a capital way, paid out of taxation. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yes. yeah. We'd be fine. Okay. All right, so I would like to just end the discussion and take a vote. So all those in favor of raising the rates three percent. Aye. Aye. And don't go put it on Facebook that you just voted no. You can at least <laughs> 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 you can bring my phone. Okay. Right. <laughs> Did you join? I'm going no too. No. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And then we'll.
that something on town meeting for the fall. Yeah, just my thinking here is if we can pass those three um, town meeting warrants and prop up the enterprise fund, then we'll, we'll know exactly what we need going forward. And if it has to be 10% to stay uh, liquid with uh, you know operating costs and everything, then so be it. But at least now we're not just kind of really, really per, per bill. I just figure out quick like a $400 bill at 3% would have been $12, which is not really a lot. But as I said last week, there there are other ways to take this money out of taxation. Okay. Okay. All right. Money. Let's move let's, on. We got it. So special to town meeting. I obviously don't because it's been on <laughs> here for three weeks. Nope. Now. I know. Well, we we got it off, so we're good. <laughs> we'll, we'll go along here. Special town meeting warrant. Opening. Um, the select board is asked to set a date. All we need to do is open it. I'm opening it. I'm opening it. We got a motion. Second. Second. Okay. okay. Any further discussion? Do you need any help with that? Or? <laughs> All those in favor of opening the warrant? <laughs> Aye. 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 Next to you. And then. Um, Aye. Aye. Yeah, we'll we'll get to that. Uh, What's the uh, date? <laughs> October 24th. October 24th, 2019. Throw Thank you, that Jess. out there to people. Yes. Um, and then I'm just going to say I would doc, or have a uh, calendar, develop the calendar for the select board. Uh, hoping you guys have reviewed it, yep. and I would just like to approve that calendar. I don't know if anyone has any changes. We'd like to make a motion. No, my guess is there may be some fluidity as we roll. There is fluidity. I gave David a few edits to it just to remove a column and change one date. But other than that. All right, I'll make a motion to accept the recommended calendar. Any further discussion? Still meetings as needed. Yeah. Or building. And this is just uh, not a specific dates calendar, but more just a general outline of tasks. I don't to have do any month meetings. Month. I'm not coming. It's <laughs> empty. <laughs> it's because they don't. Well, yeah. Spreadsheet technical difficulties. So, but, but this really isn't for select board meetings. This is for all the other kind of big ticket items. That we're this is all the things that yeah. we're going to be doing month to month. Okay. Yeah, it's not a it's not a calendar for the specific dates. Yeah. Yeah. Sounds good. Wait, wait, did you need a second? Second. Oh, all those in favor? I Aye. said for discussion. Aye. 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 Okay. Um, <laughs> we can do library real quick guys really quick sure we're yeah. super quick yeah so we were hoping that the contract would be ready today for you to sign from Orlando Anuli the general contractor that we you know sort of reviewed last week um, they are finishing their internal review tomorrow we had a flurry of emails from today so we are hoping that rather than wait for the next <coughs> elect board meeting uh, you guys will vote to authorize somebody amongst you to sign the contract when it arrives from the general contractor so that they can proceed. Uh, they've got their bonds, everything's, they're just trying to line up all the paperwork from the submitters. How does procurement feel about that? Fine. Okay. Uh, the, with the caveat that we bring this back for uh, ratification. ratification on July 10th so that it's all done in public meeting. So can I make a motion to allow David uh, to sign on behalf of the select board uh, with the caveat that will be brought back to the full board? Second. Any further discussion? <coughs> All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So we look be, forward to so starting now. As soon now. as the paperwork's signed, they're able to get going, or do they have to wait till January 10th, July 10th? No, uh, bringing the contract to me. Yep. Notice to proceed has already yep. been issued. Yep. We're rocking and rolling. Awesome. Thank you. Right. That's what we were hoping. Thank you. Okay. And then um, uh, the building inspector requests to start as assistant at the fiscal year 2020 pay rate, effective June 17th. No. No. April. April. Whatever. We can get it. I got it. April 29th. So, to April yeah, Tim has asked since we basically voted to increase the building inspector assistant salary in fiscal year 2020. He has budget left or money remaining in his budget and would like to increase her pay effective April 29th, which I believe is when we maybe took that budget vote. Yes. So I do have some money left over in a salary line item. 
I uh, want to use some of that just to uh, give her a little bit of compensation for what she's been doing in the last couple months. Uh, that's all it is. What does that equal in dollars? Yeah. How much? Um, One thousand two hundred. And is that the retroactive? Is there, or is that for the entire, for the entire fiscal year, year to, no, to finish up the fiscal year? So twelve hundred up until now, and then there's just one more pay remaining after yeah. that. Mm -hmm. And then July first, it's going to go into effect. It's automatically going. That's fine. Mm -hmm. What what date did it start? April. April twenty ninth. Let's see. So just basically one, two. So it's three pay periods or four. It's one hundred forty-four dollars per week, and yeah. cut out these numbers. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um. So, made that request. Um, I think that there's money in his budget. The question is, you know, we're having we're going to be hearing the compensation and classification plan tonight. How does that affect, you know, all that activity that's going on and those kind of things? Mm -hmm. I think it's First kind of a board better decision. We had that compensation yeah. before, but, you know, it is reality. And, and uh, how is your budget otherwise? Are you short in any other no. areas? Or? I'm fine in every line item. And the re one of the main reasons I have the money there is, unfortunately, last year when I did go on vacation, uh, Paul Tacey, who usually comes in during the daytime, Went in the hospital at the same time. Okay. So I didn't really have much coverage. Only at night time. I'll make a motion to accept it. Second. Yes. Okay. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Thank, thank you, you very much. Yeah, thank you, Tim. appreciate it. It's very kind of you. Okay. The killing us. The killing us. <laughs> How about uh, real quick, we hit annual appointments and then so we will appoint staff volunteers and officials to municipal committees. Jennifer submitted a list here to all of us. There is one mistake that I saw. Um, okay. Municipal building committee. Do uh, you have Andy Klepacki on that list? He is not on okay. there. It's Claire Carr. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that got fixed. It's still on there, but. Okay. I'm wondering if there's some of these we should. Also, Mr. Chairman, um, I also find a mistake there. Okay, go ahead. Uh, under the order, order appointments, I think on the last, Scott McCarthy, the field superintendent for DPW. Oh yeah, field superintendent. Mm -hmm. he's, not, uh, he's not gonna, I he's don't think he's ever been list. For an annual appointment, it's, uh, it, the board just hired him for. So you're saying he shouldn't be on here? Yeah, he's wondering why is why is he an appointment? Why is he an appointed? Yeah, he's just an employee. Not just. Okay, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Okay, <laughs> okay. The board just hired him for. Uh, yeah, but they want to go. So, yeah. So. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I agree. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'll make a motion to accept the list. One thing that I mm -hmm. think is missing on isn't uh, Drew Matt, Warden is not here. So mm -hmm. Matt Kusha isn't he on agriculture? <laughs> He was on agriculture. Yeah, he's not listed on there. Mm -hmm. And I know he's been kind of doing some public things with it lately. So mm -hmm. I didn't see that name on. Is he still in there, David? Yeah. So this is, sounds like there's a couple of mistakes. We'll uh, clean it up and uh, we'll get the appointment papers going to the right people. And if we have to put this back on the consent agenda just to make care take care of yeah, for the mistakes, that would be fine. Yeah. So I'll do we, it and then come back to I feel like there's yeah. more people on cultural council too. Well, I'm just Are you meeting again in June? No. 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 We need a treasurer. We need an assistant treasurer. Yeah, so you should have an assistant treasurer. Mm -hmm. yeah, I, I would make sure you have an left any right. of our important posts unattended for July 1. Right. Committees are different. And uh, <laughs> yeah, we need John's appointment to go through. No, I'm just going to do that. She's on here. That's on here. Also. She's I thought on you were talking about putting it up at a, yeah. uh, 
doing it again in two in no. July then. It's here. Jones here. So you are voting tonight? Yes. Oh, I thought you were saying you were gonna vote in July. Well, um I so I'm wondering if we should approve the um appointed positions and leave the committees for a future meeting. Can Want we to do, do that? that? Yeah. I, I'd like to talk about um I mean and I know there have been a couple of conversations, but we, we haven't discussed it as a board about uh, the Municipal Building Committee and also the um, uh, PEG, the Hadley Media, you mm -hmm. know, just taking a look at the composition of those and making sure that we... Okay, so Joyce, you made a motion to approve the list. Do you mind amending that just to approve the appointed positions? So I'll make the amendment to approve the appointed positions. Okay, I'll second that. Okay, any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank another, you. No, just a, another question I have too is I'd be curious, I'd like to find out that some of these people are actually participating. Mm -hmm. I mean, their name's yes. on the list, but you know, Pioneer Valley yeah, Planning Commission, is David Moskin going? Maybe he is, I don't know, but you know, we should probably just do a little bit more research. Yeah, clean it up. Okay. And clean it. No. Yeah, you don't have enough people on the, uh, what was the other one I was looking at? Well, can I okay. ask for one quick thing on this list? Oh, conservation I don't have enough members there. Mm -hmm. uh, and capital. Right. Christine Kelly on the Shade Tree Committee. I know that uh, Jennifer had been working to, I guess, uh, revive that committee, and I know they're waiting for her to be on there so they could submit some documents to uh, Arbor Day or some, something like that. So. Can I be appoint her? I know the others have been appointed. She's on the list. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know she submitted a letter, but I don't. I think we ever voted on appointing her to the thing. That's the issue. Okay. Yeah, there wasn't. There was somebody else too that you did put on Facebook today. Yeah. <laughs> and I, that, oh, that was uh, Mary Thayer for uh, yeah. cemetery. Cemetery. Yeah. We, we did vote that last meeting, I think, but. Mm -hmm. issue, I'll right? second. But yeah. cemetery's not even on here. Yeah. yeah. I'll second your motion. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, how about we just, if you see edits, send them to Jennifer, them, yeah. and um, let's do that. Yeah, there's, there's a few of us in here. Yeah. Okay. Um, Excuse me. Can I yes. ask a quick question? Go for it. Uh, will you folks be discussing anything regarding the Hadley Kids After School Program? Mm -hmm. I am here as a representative of that. And That's I just nothing to... there is on our okay. agenda, but I didn't say public comment. If you want, we can open up public comment real quick and you could say something. We sure. said a couple things. We talked about it a little bit last week. Last week. Yeah. Sure. Okay. It's just not on our agenda. But okay. okay. Yeah. I if you want to say to something real quick, you can. I uh, well, can I attended comment. the uh, school committee meeting at 530, mm -hmm. and the school committee voted to accept the, uh, the after school program taking over the after school program. So I just simply wanted to bring that to your attention. And that would be okay. under DESI. It would be under DESI, exactly. Um, and I believe their intention will be for uh, Amy McKenzie as the superintendent of the schools to be the administrator of the program as the licensee as she's applying for the license. But she is looking to have Jenny Lemberg from Park and Rec still be the director of the program itself. Well, so is it still going to be a in with the Park and Rec Commission, or well, that was part of the discussion last right. week also? From what I understand, um, the the portion of her salary where they agreed to increase her hours um, based on the fact that they were going to be taking on the after school program, from what I understand, that would be a line item that would be decided from the school as far as covering those additional hours from their that budgeting. Yeah, and my conversation with Annie McKenzie was that they do a very similar thing with the police with the and with police, the, SO yes. the student resource officer, mm -hmm. and they do a transfer to the police department. It could be very something very similar with the um, park, park and rec. rec. And school. Exactly. Yep. Okay. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So Jenny would still remain with park and rec. And yeah, we were just wondering overseeing all the, the program, yeah. so it would kind of be a win-win okay. where we would be able to institute that the program would still continue. Yeah, it would be able to move forward for the next upcoming school year. But Great. Jenny Lemberg would also still be extremely involved with the day-to-day -day operations as the director for the program. Yeah, and I'm, I'm all in favor of keeping the program running, and it, oh, yeah. you know, I know Desi, the other school districts do it this way. But my only question is just, um, we should make sure that when we're talking about that remuneration between the school and money coming back, if there's any incremental cost 
um, to overhead burden, that needs to be taken into account as well, not just straight salary hours. And I don't know how they're doing it with police or anything, but um, an increase in her hours impacts retirement and OPEB as well. It wouldn't affect it like medical in, or something. In Jenny's hours is, or, is, or Annie? Jenny's. Yeah, Jenny's hours. Mm -hmm. So we need to make sure that. My understanding is her hours were already increased for FY20, or <coughs> FY2019. Her hours were already increased. Too. They think, were. They, they were. It was not calculated into the budget of her salary because they were under the impression that the after school would be in park and rec before the end of the fiscal year. So the revenue that was coming in from the after school was going to offset the yes. increase in her salary right. because right. of it the was hours. All under the but town. it did not. Right. So had the kids paid the differential in her salary? For the increase to, in the hours for FY19. As a reimbursement. Okay. To as the a reimbursement. To the town. To the okay. town. Yes. Okay. Exactly. Yeah, they, so yeah, you don't pay Jenny, you pay. You pay no, right. exactly. Coming back. I, yeah. We, okay. we cut a check physically to the town of Hadley yeah. to cover her additional hours. Got it. The salary increase that she received for FY19 because we were under the impression that the program would be within the park and rec before the end of the fiscal year, right. which clearly it's it did not happen. Yeah. Um, so, like I said, um, from what I understand, that would be something that they would be discussed between the school department and um, and the, the park and rec ultimately. Yeah, the accountant and all that. Is the, exactly. Okay, is the DESE license the same as the current? Uh, they are, yes, through the EEC. It, it's still the same type of licensing process. Unfortunately, with EEC, the process is uh, much more detailed um, because typically it applies for home daycares and large group daycares, so there is a lot there's more additional more restrictions yeah. um, that come into play. Under DESE, there are less restrictions. The other um, possible positive in the whole thing is we are restricted. How the kids think is licensed through EEC for up to 52 kids per day. There is a strong demand for the program to the point where we are already at max capacity for the upcoming school year with a wait list. Mm -hmm. And the folks that are on the wait list a lot of them are school choice that are depending on that care to enroll as a school choice. So they're being held up because of that. Under DESE, they simply have the restriction of they would need to have one staff member per 13 children, but it doesn't limit the number of children. So if they wanted to increase their enrollment to you know, 60 kids, 70 kids, as long as they had sufficient staff on, they could increase those numbers, which would be a huge benefit to the program itself, because like I said, there is a rather large demand for it. Okay, thank you very much for yeah. saying that, and uh, we look forward to it continuing. Fantastic. So, I'm, keep, I'm gonna end it there, so thank okay. you. That's perfectly fine. Yeah. Thank you very much, yeah. I appreciate thank it. You. I just wanna clarify something. Okay, um, so we're gonna move on to prep for SMP bond rating. Just like to get that past us. So we have a number of um, uh, documents that we need to update and uh, approve. Uh, last week we put this on hold for further review, but tonight we'd like to approve this since we have our SMP bond rating review on Friday. So I'll make, make a motion to accept the S&P bond uh, review that we have in front of us this evening. I'll, I'll this. Yeah. Second. Okay, any further discussion? Molly, you weren't here last week. Do you have anything you no, want to add? I've or had a separate meeting with them, and I've been through the PowerPoints, and I will be there on Friday. Okay. We're talking about economic development. <laughs> Great. <laughs> she has a role. <laughs> all right, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Great. Yeah, thank you. And then, uh, Don, we can, uh, you have a presentation for us for the compensation and classification plan update. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah. Um, do you want me to come? Oh, sure, yeah, come on up, yeah. Um, you have in your packet, I believe, uh, a summary of uh, what I refer to as a quote unquote final report. Um, Last time I met with you, we talked about developing a uh, classification plan um, based on 
two criteria really. One, to develop a grade level structure that's consistent with the organizational structure of each department. And secondly, to develop um, a grade level or classification plan based on quote unquote responsibility. You notice what I didn't say was the classification plan is developed based on market data. Mm -hmm. That's not how it's been developed. Um, let me step back one second and just make sure that you know that uh, we're all on the same page. In developing a classification compensation plan, we're really trying to develop a process to both pay a position and pay an employee, and as I pointed out, with two basic criteria or two basic standards in mind. To do both consistently, meaning paying a position, paying an employee, and secondly, to do so competitively, both internally as well as externally. And that's the basic purpose uh, behind developing a classification and quote-unquote compensation plan. Um, so last time I shared with you, uh, at least my recommendation, was that um, one of the aspects of managing classification uh, consistently, another word to use besides competitive, is also flexibly, giving you the ability to make decisions relative to how to pay positions I recommend as flexibly as possible. Um, I recommended that essentially the town establish three plans, general government plan, police, and we're talking about non-union positions, mm -hmm. um, police and fire, three separate classification um, compensation plans. What's been accomplished since I last met with you, uh, we've now collected market data. And again, you, in your packet, I believe you have some charts that show you basically one, the market data that's been collected from, I believe it was nine communities, um, and how now a quote unquote compensation plan, what I mean by compensation plan uh, is basically a salary range structure, a minimum, maximum range consistent with the grade level structure, uh, and I should state, you know, for people that haven't seen it, uh, the summary report, uh, for general government, um, what has been recommended is that the classification plan would consist of seven grade levels. I would draw your attention to what I refer to as a characteristic chart that explains the quote unquote characteristics that define or explain each of the seven grade levels within the general government plan. Mm -hmm. Likewise, for the fire um, and police positions, what I've recommended are two grade levels for the police non-union positions and four grade levels for the fire positions. And again, in, all, in each instance, uh, there's a characteristic plan that explains to you, in layman's terms, the characteristics that define each of the grade levels uh, in those respective plans. So with that structure in, in mind, three plans and grade levels consistent with one the organizational structure of each department within those plans, and secondly, uh, consistent um, with the. Um, what was I say? <laughs> I forgot what I was going to say. Um, consistent with the organizational structure. Oh, and the level of responsibility. Mm -hmm. It's kind of late. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Great meeting, by the way. <laughs> yeah, it's very late. So. Um, so What's before you this evening now is a compensation plan consisting of salary ranges. Um, and what I'm recommending, again, <coughs> in order to develop a compensation plan consistently, what you see now are basically three criteria that we've used or I've used to develop the salary ranges for each of the grade levels. And those three criteria are basically, one, the market data that we've collected from the, um, um, from the salary survey, and specifically the survey average midpoint of that market data. And you'll see there's a chart in your plan that's entitled Proposed Salary Range to Fiscal 19 Market Data. Mm -hmm. That chart will show you exactly, one, the market data that was collected, and it's organized by survey average minimum, midpoint, and maximum. But it's the midpoint, survey average midpoint data that I refer to as any, I label it as a benchmark, that we're using as a guide to develop the minimum and the maximum for each grade level. Can I just... Yeah, please yeah. Um, in your PowerPoint, you refer, refer to the data charts? Correct. But we were not provided the data charts. Uh, well, I gave them to David to, I think you've set them out, haven't you? You mean the salary data charts you're talking about? Yeah. We you, just you have gave, the PowerPoint. You gave me the, the information which I posted on there. Right. So I think you have now sounds, everything. Sounds like you need to, we need to get the additional information out to the board. 
Yeah, we have uh, the, the PowerPoint, and then we have compensation and classification plans for each general government, police, and fire. But those are all words. They're but, not. Yeah, no, you, you didn't get the, the spreadsheets charts. that show you the. Uh, the survey data? Oh, no, no. I thought it was in that packet I gave you. So I guess so I can understand the numbers and the words that are in front of me. Where you say general government salary ranges, survey average minimum uh, minus 22.29. So are you saying that uh, our minimum pay scale is 22% below market values or that we need to reduce it 22% to be No, 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 no. <laughs> no, no, no. Um, <laughs> You're looking at page three of the uh, of the handout. Um, yeah, correct. That first section is really designed, is intended just to simply show you what currently exists today for general government positions when you look at your current range structure right. and compare that to the survey data that was collected. Uh, your survey, uh, your current range is on, for your minimums are roughly about 22% below the survey average minimum. Okay, below the average. Not below the average. Okay. And likewise, your current general government, we're talking about general government initially, uh, your, your current general government maximum <laughs> ranges are roughly about 10% below the survey average maximum. Mm -hmm. Okay. And mm -hmm. for police and fire, all I've said is your, your current minimums in your police and fire salary ranges are roughly about 1.5% below the survey average minimum. And then your current salary maximum range maximum for police and fire positions is roughly about 13% above the survey average maximum. Just to give you a sense of where your minimum maximums are today. So wouldn't uh, that suggest that police and fire are more in alignment with the market? With data, the market. From yeah. a position standpoint. From a position right. standpoint That's compared correct. to general government. And then what follows uh, is what I'm proposing to you uh, to be the new salary range structure for general government, police and fire. Mm -hmm. um, and as you can see the proposed average minimums for the seven grade levels, and again, unfortunately, you don't have the backup charts to show you where these particular numbers are. When you see the backup charts, mm -hmm. what I'm referring to is the survey data we've collected for general government positions. When you compare that survey data to the proposed range minimums for general government for those seven grade levels, if you look at the minimums for all seven levels, compare that to the market data, the proposed minimums are roughly about 12% below the salary survey minimums whereas the maximums for general government are roughly about 13.5% greater. Yeah. And I'll come back to that in a second. On the police side, you can see the proposed salary range minimums for the two grade levels in the police positions is roughly about 13% below the salary survey average minimum, whereas the proposed maximums, it once again, is much greater than the market data, roughly about 14, a little bit more than 14.5% greater. And the same thing is true of the fire positions. Mm -hmm. Proposed minimums are roughly about 11% below the market data. Proposed maximums are roughly about 17, almost 18% greater. And that's because you're, you're trying to put us in this competitive band. That's right, because right. what I'm trying to do is present well, a range chart here, months. minimum, maximum, yep. that's determined by, it's driven by one market data, mm -hmm. specifically the survey average midpoint. Mm -hmm. Secondly, the current rate of pay of the employees in the, in the different positions and how those rates of pay today compare to the survey average midpoint, or excuse me, the proposed benchmark, which is the survey average midpoint. And then thirdly, how long each employee has been in their current position. Mm -hmm. So really what I'm suggesting from, a, or what I'm recommending from a process standpoint, is that there are three criteria that we're using to define competitive, the word competitive. Mm -hmm. And really what I'm talking about tonight is really specifically paying a position. The compensation as it pertains to an employee is the third and last step in the study, which hasn't been done yet. Mm -hmm. So the plan that you have in front of you, and I know this may sound a little bit crazy or a little bit odd, establishing grade levels and salary ranges by itself doesn't cost the town any money. So it's not a cost mm -hmm. issue. It really boils down to an issue, in my opinion, where you as a board, as well as employees, need to one, understand the process that's been followed and be comfortable with it so that you're able to maintain the plan that's being presented to you. Mm -hmm. So the maintenance of the plan, where you go from here, in terms of the grade levels and the salary ranges, the, the grade levels are really going to be maintained based on your organizational structure, based on different levels of responsibility for all the different positions, because that's what the classification plan is meant to reflect. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So when I say there's seven grade levels in the general government proposed plan, 
what I'm saying is that there's seven different levels of responsibility. If you don't understand what I mean by responsibility, all you need to do is look at the characteristic chart. And that chart will explain it to you in very, in fact, you'll, you'll notice that in each grade level, whether it's police, fire, or general government, the key characteristic in each grade level is underlined. It's in big, bold print for you. Mm -hmm. So you can see exactly what we mean by grade level one and why grade level two is different. Not based on market data, but how it's different based on responsibility. Yeah, I think you did a good job making that clear. Yeah. So. Good. Mm -hmm. yeah, that, that is ultimately, believe it or not, as compared to the dollars and cents aspect of a study like that, that is the significant change that I'm recommending. That is the most mm -hmm. significant change. That's the big you know, perception being nine-tenths of the game. One, we're looking at three plans now, not one. And secondly, we're looking at a grade level structure that we can explain based on your organizational structure. So that when you make changes going forward with regard to hiring a new position, whether it's an HR director or, or any position, the process that will be in place for you that you haven't had up until now is a process to determine how to pay the position first based on the level of responsibility for that position, mm -hmm. which really means the job description. Mm -hmm. Keep in mind, we've written job descriptions intentionally to describe responsibility. And not to bore you with a lot more detail about how that breaks down on the job description, but when you see the final plan, meaning the final job descriptions that are consistent with the different grade level structures, I think you'll have a better understanding when you compare one description to another, um, assuming that you're looking at two positions, let's say, for example, that are at different grade levels. The job descriptions will tell you why. Because they've been written the intentionally that way. Um, you know, we have a director of human resource position to hire. Right, and I've given David a, a draft job yep. description. Yep. So I wrote that position consistent with the seven grade level plan that you now have in front of you for general government. Except we don't actually have the numbers, but if we did, mm -hmm. they would drop into that. Well, it was easy for me to say that yeah. recommend to David. Mm -hmm. right. In fact, the HR position is included in here only yep. because I know you're looking at it right now and I wanted you to see where mm -hmm. it might wind up. Once you approve the job description, Mm -hmm. Once you approve the level of responsibility for the position, mm -hmm. in effect, what you're doing then is classifying the position. Once again, not based on market data. Right. I don't mean to keep harping on that, mm -hmm. but I know that we, what has been typically done up until now has been to use market data to assign it to a grade level. That's not the way this process is designed to work. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, the other thing that I just want to touch base with you on, uh, if you look at the last page, what I find to be helpful for you to have is a guide to help you interpret market data. It's one thing to collect it, but the obvious question is, well, what does it mean? How significant is it? And all I'm suggesting here is that what I've experienced in my own practice, as well as what I've seen other companies do, is typically use a, a range, as I said, to define the word competitive, you see it says plus or minus 15%. There's nothing magical about 15. It's not a fixed number. It's just a reasonable number that I've found to be very effective to help you interpret data. So going back to those earlier ranges that I was quoting the percentages, what I've used to help me develop a plan and present it to you tonight that I think is competitive is that plus a 15% guideline. Um, so that going forward, as you collect new market data and you use that market data in comparison to what exists at that point in time, if your market data indicates that your current range structure, for example, is more than 15% less than that market data, whether it's at the minimum end or the maximum end, that's an indication that you might need to re re revise your ranges. Mm -hmm. The reason why I wanted to say that to you tonight is that the process that I'm recommending in developing ranges, the objective is to develop a range that's wide enough with today's market data, which is why I, I emphasize that maximum number, so that you don't have to change your ranges every year. Mm -hmm. This proposed plan and when you compare it to the market data, and unfortunately you don't have the market data right in front of you at the moment, but when you do see it, you'll notice, you know, when I say plus, uh, well, like for the general government um, maximum number, I said it was plus 13.5%. Um, uh, well, I'm saying the average maximums for those seven grade levels, when you compare those numbers to the current market data we collected, they're roughly about 13.5% greater than today's market data. Mm -hmm. Doesn't cost you any money to establish a maximum. No one gets paid a minimum or a maximum. They're there strictly as a guide to help us develop a hiring range and then secondly a market equity range within each salary range. Mm -hmm. Okay? Uh, and I know this is maybe a little bit too much. Um, 
so what I, I really want to just let, let me try to capsulize or summarize for you. The grade level structure has been developed based on responsibility, consistent with your organizational structure. Um, look at the characteristic chart and it will explain to you the meaning behind each of the grade levels and why they're different. Um, what we mean by grade level one versus two and so on. The salary ranges have been developed using three criteria. First one is the market data, specifically the survey average benchmark for each grade level, for each group of positions. So that you'll see there's a chart that you, you'll receive that's entitled proposed salary range to survey data chart. Mm -hmm. That ultimately will become, frankly, in my opinion, probably the most important chart in the whole study because that will show you everything you need to see relative to, one, the market data we collected, specifically the survey average midpoint and how that midpoint average number, so-called benchmark, has been used to develop a minimum and a maximum linked to the benchmark. <coughs> okay? Mm -hmm. um, so that one of the things that you'll notice when you look at that benchmark number for each grade level, each survey average midpoint, you'll notice that the benchmark number has a graduated increase from the lowest grade level to the highest grade level. Not by any fixed percentage, but the numbers are greater, starting from grade level one, which tells you basically that the market data is consistent with your grade level structure. In other words, the higher the level of responsibility, at the same time, the higher the market data. Mm -hmm. So the two are hand in hand, mm -hmm. which I think you know is, is ideally the way you'd want to structure a plan so that the more responsibility someone takes on, um, the higher the level of compensation. That sounds great. Um, so with the, all this information uh, and the numbers we're supposed to receive, the Excel spreadsheet, when is the final plan going to be all set, set and tied up? Right. So the last step is to develop a process to pay the employees. So what I, what I do, and I've talked to David today about scheduling a meeting initially with your department heads to discuss with them ways to pay themselves as well as other employees more money going forward. So what I'll give you is a chart that will basically plot all the employees where they are today within these respective grade level structures. Mm -hmm. So whether it's police, fire, general government, there'll be another chart that we'll give you that will show you where everybody is today. Mm -hmm. Their current rate of pay, and secondly, how long they've been in their current position okay. on I, one piece of paper. I, I don't think you should be meeting with the departments and suggesting their pay raises. I think I want to see well, that. Well, we're I not talking about dollar amounts. We're talking about saying. process. I, First, yeah. before we. Huh? I just let him finish what he's saying. Just to, I want to see where well, he was going like with it. I don't like what he's saying so far. Well, I, <laughs> okay. Well, whichever way you want to do this, yeah. what, what I've proposed mm -hmm. is to meet with your department heads to talk to them about um, different ways to pay people more money. Not specific dollar amounts, not cost, but process. Um, but be that as may, you know, whichever way the board's comfortable is, I'm happy to follow whatever your lead might be. So the next step is really to develop a process to pay employees more money. Um, one of the things I'll mention to you tonight is that what I always recommend is making a distinction between exempt positions and non-exempt positions. In other words, positions that are required to plan what to do and how to do it in my opinion, should be paid based on responsibility, more money. Now we're mm -hmm. talking about the employee, mm -hmm. not the position. Whereas non-exempt positions by definition are not required to plan what to do. Mm -hmm. They're required to carry out job duties, but the responsibility to plan, in other words, to take on the risk associated with managing a department, if responsibility works well to pay positions more money, which I think you now see it does work very effectively, um, the issue of paying employees more money based on responsibility also works very effectively. So my intention is really to show you a process, a way to do that, mm -hmm. uh, a way to pay employees, not based on cost of living, and not based on percentages, but based on dollars and cents. So that really what it, my objective is to get you to a point where now with a plan in place, grade levels and salary ranges, you're able to determine how much you can afford to spend on compensation. The issue that really remains at that point is what's the best way to spend the money. Mm -hmm. once you determine how much. So you're always working within your fiscal constraints. And have you figured out where we're going to get that money? That's I, not I what you've asked me to do. That. I, I know, but you're coming in saying, no, we'll have this discussion among ourselves. I, I think you right misunderstood now. me. Yeah. No, I understood that you want to meet with the department yeah. and how the, how the to get their input. On to how they not how get, much, well, but different ways to do it. In other words, there is no different way to do it. It comes from the Board of Selectmen. 
No, no I, I, yeah, I think he's. I think he's talking about process. But I'm talking about process. I'm, there are I'm different ways to pay. Right now, the town of Hadley pays employees more money based on two criteria. Right. One is cost of living. Right. That you label cost of living. I'm not mm -hmm. sure if it is or not, but that's what you call it. Mm -hmm. And secondly, is a year of service. Right. You have a ten-step plan today, and you max out depending upon where you start. Yeah, it's effectively a longevity plan. Yeah. Right. It's years of service. That's correct. Right. But you max out after X, you know, there's, you have 10 steps, that's the maximum. Mm -hmm. So essentially you're paying employees more money two ways. There are at least three or four other ways that I could mention to you and I, and I would s submit for you to think about, one of which is competitiveness now. Remember the main change that we're developing here in relative to paying both a position and an employee, we've now defined the word competitive. Mm -hmm. You'll know, so let's talk about an employee for a second. You'll know whether so-and-so's salary today is competitive or not as it relates to the benchmark, the survey average midpoint. Mm -hmm. And secondly, how long they've been in their current position. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so I think I think the, the challenge that I've got right now is we're on the we're on the cusp of hiring a human resource director. Right. So what I'm questioning is and I, I I know what you, you heard. I didn't think that that's what he actually meant. Like he was going to go sit with Tim and say, "Let's figure out how we can get some more money out of the budget to pay your no, people." No, no, no. It, not it's at not all. that. It's the process oh, and understanding the criteria. Oh, got all the money. I <laughs> <laughs> understanding the criteria <laughs> and reorienting how <laughs> department wrong, right. heads think about, you know, if so if in fact I'm going to move somebody up, right right more, now? Is that what you're saying? more responsibility. <laughs> Well, because yeah. we don't really have any sort of merit-based system right now. Yeah. Yeah. But I, I think that that conversation right now should be had with us before it's had with the department heads. Yes. But then I understand why, of course, it has to be had with the department heads. It's just, I, I think we're, if we had an HR person, you would be having that conversation with yeah. them first. Yeah. That's the reason why I'm here tonight is one to say I've collected all the market data yeah. and by using the market data we've developed ranges and that's right. what you have in front of you tonight. Yeah. See I'd yeah. like to see the data and then the and the existing staff now inventoried and, and overlaid into what you've come up with right. before there's further conversation with the departments. Yeah. Okay. So that's I mean I my preference so, would have them come back here. So we have the information from you. I didn't realize it was supposed to be on tonight's meeting. I'm sorry for the confusion. I'll get that to the select board right away. And so what what, what I would suggest, Mr. Chair, and what I would like to do then is um, the next meeting when I come to meet with you, then I'll bring with me uh, or I'll submit to you a proposal uh, or a process for you to consider relative to how to pay employees more money. <laughs> yeah, yes. well, I think when you, when you say that, that's yeah. what's yeah. difficult here. And I know you're, I'm assuming you're saying that saying based on the mm -hmm. chart it's, that My you email box is filling up as we speak. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe I've said that the wrong way. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think so. Have you met with him for, I think, I think Claire, can I clarify? Help? Try and help you clarify. Yeah, please do. Okay, we have a way for paying employees more money, and it's the grade and the step system, and it's Today. COLAs. Right. He's suggesting an alternate way to just instead of saying, and then you jump here, and then you jump here, and it's time for your step, that there's another process for right. getting to that raise, and right. they may or may not. There are other ways to pay people so more money, is all I'm saying. I'm going to tell you, but I know how to somebody thinks I somebody's going to hearing. get a raise and somebody isn't, we're in trouble. <laughs> right. and, oh, and, and I, I didn't know. say that. And I think that you. If somehow I've conveyed yeah. that to you, that's a mistake. Yeah. I, I think the, the thing we need to see is... No, I brought all that to your attention the last time you right. were here also, by qualifications and years of service, and that's the way the steps were set so it's up. It's a method. But all that, yeah, but the, all that needs to be calculated into this method that you have. It will be. That's right. It will be. But again, you haven't asked me to determine how much the town can afford. That's not part of the study. No. So we're not saying to anybody that there's an automatic or that there's any kind of increase because that has not been determined until you decide first how much money you can afford to spend as part of your budget process and secondly what the best way is to spend the money. All I'm trying to suggest to you tonight is that, is that yeah. there are other ways to pay people more money than the way you've been doing it. I think more effectively. I would prefer yeah. your language to be there are different ways to handle okay. compensation. Yes. Mm -hmm. Right. than how you're handling it now. Right. Possible yeah. future. Because unfortunately people at home listening, all they're hearing is ka-ching, 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 yeah. which isn't necessarily which is, a bad thing. And that's thing, not what we're talking about. Exactly. And if I say that, I apologize. That's a mistake well, on my Well, more part. money kind of leads mm. to yeah. Right. That's right. Remember, I think I said to you when we first met, <laughs> the 
purpose, yeah. the objective, my, the reason why I'm here is not to determine how much money the town can afford to spend. Okay. But I am here to recommend a process, a way for you to spend money in a more consistent, in a more competitive way, mm -hmm. both internally and externally, so that um, everyone understands how it's being done. Mm -hmm. And remember, every, once the study is complete, so basically we're two-thirds of the way done with completing the study. The only thing we ha I haven't shown you yet, which I will let you, you know, when I can schedule a time to come back and meet with you, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> will be a process to pay, to compensate employees, period. Thank you. Okay. I want to see that. All right, that's a good ending point, I think. <laughs> um, so, yes, thank you, Don. And maybe we can get you back <laughs> maybe in July sometime. Mm -hmm. Come back. Oh, uh, absolutely. That works. Sooner the better. Okay. July. July. Okay. So, so you in the meantime, uh, David yeah. will send you the survey data that we've collected. Please. They'll send you those yeah. other support charts that will explain to you how we've developed the ranges. So that when we meet next time, obviously, if you have questions regarding how the market data has been used, and you got police okay. in there. They're under contract. These are non-union. We don't have many non-union. We don't have yeah. any non-union. He's, He's he, no, he met we with have the two levels. So there's only two. Chief and uh, police chief and lieutenant. Right, right. Lieutenant. Yeah. So there are no union they're positions. They're under contract. That's that. That's an employment agreement relative to how you it's pay still, them. No, it is not. It is in their contract on what they get paid. You talking about the union or the? No, I'm talking about the police chief and the lieutenant. It is. Well, that's right. It's right. A, but when we establish, contract. but when we establish what we're going to pay somebody, we should be doing it within the context of a compensation plan. Yeah, essentially, what I'm, what I'll be giving you for, for, for those positions will be just a, a guide for you to follow to negotiate that agreement or those yeah. contracts. Mm -hmm. Obviously, how much, what their working conditions are, which includes compensation, is subject to you negotiating with them, whatever that agreement might be. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Dan. Uh, all right. So, uh, with Linda here, let's look at mm -hmm. end of year budget transfers. I hope we can get through that pretty quickly. Yeah, that will be very quickly. So, I met with the Finance Committee to, uh, before this meeting, and we uh, did a bunch of line to line uh, transfers. Um, and we did a bunch of reserve fund transfers in order to support the. Uh, health insurance and uh, a couple of other line items. The only thing we have for us tonight is the um, um, transfer of 22750 from the veterans benefits line to the health insurance line. The health insurance line needs about 32000 There's been other transfers to support it. Veterans benefit was uh, originally uh, budgeted $104,000 for the year. There's a surplus of about $25,000 left in that that we don't think that we will need. So in order to support the health insurance line, uh, we're requesting a transfer line in line from veterans benefits to health insurance. Why is the health insurance uh, budget over? Um, overdrawn is because we had higher than expected upgrades, single to family plans, uh, more employees are ha getting married and having babies. So we didn't understand that that would happen during the budget season last year. So that's driving that cost up. I'm confused. How does that align with the spreadsheet that we have? It doesn't. I had to redo that. Oh. So are we balanced okay. now or is it? We should be balanced. Gotcha. Okay, with that transfer, that balance. With that transfer us. and the ones that the finance committee approved a little bit earlier. So we need to make a motion to transfer twenty-two seven fifty from veterans benefits to health insurance. Yep. Second. Any Do further discussion? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Any further discussion? Nope. Uh, what did What did you do with uh, snow and ice? That's coming out. Of snow and ice came out of reserve fund. That's all covered. Okay. Oh, okay. So they took care of that column. Yeah. So finance. Finance took care of that. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. <laughs> okay. Um, and let's just, since you guys are here most likely for the fire substation, we can go there real quick. No? You guys not, not fire? North Hadley Hall. North Hadley Hall? No. We just, we thought we were here for the cemetery. And yeah, any questions or there. Well, you need so a block. we received. <laughs> <laughs> So on just an update on that, on Tuesday we received three bids 
for the cemetery mowing project. The bids are complicated. We've taken them under advisement and we'll have a report for the select board at your next meeting. July 10th. July 10th. July 10th, yeah. yeah. No. Okay. So we don't have any updates on it right now. Sorry. <laughs> Okay. You didn't have anything better to do. I'm just gonna say. Yeah. <laughs> sure you enjoy this. Oh, here. So hey, come tomorrow. back again next week. We're gonna have more fun. Oh, you don't have to sign, Joyce. <laughs> I don't. No. Let me tell you, it's, uh, there's, there's too many people in the room. You get all screwed up here. <laughs> <laughs> We're trying. All right, let's get that out of here. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Nice to see you. Thank you. Um, all right, we can just, we have, uh, yeah, we could do Senior Center update real quick. Do you want to do that, Jane? Uh, they're we working on it. They've um, found another problem, but with the water main and hooking into it, but they're planning accordingly since it's 103 year, it was installed in 1903, so it's uh, fragile. 1903. And, and they are planning accordingly. Yeah, so we'll be having to shut down the water main between, I don't know where it where it is, but it's basically between Middle and East yeah, Street. Somewhere between Middle and East. Uh, When's that? Happening? After business hours. After business yeah. hours. It's probably going to be next week, but they need to coordinate. Yeah. They hope next week. That's on Route 9? On yeah, Route 9, yeah. Right, just, right just in front before of where they had the water break in front of Legion yeah. last week or two weeks ago. Um, okay. That fragile uh, one. And uh, the sewer problems they have already resolved so yes. yeah and they've heard from um, environmental protection about the asbestos and the plan has been set in place and that work will start next week how much yeah. did the tab run on they're, that plan oh that's a that's a we running bill <laughs> we don't know until they know what they found and how much of it and where it has to go and they're right now bidding, looking for where to take it in terms of the best bid do they, do they know what it is right now? Or? What What is? Asbestos. Asbestos? Did they nope. take a sample of it? They didn't even no, oh, it's yeah. asbestos. They know yeah. it's asbestos. They know it's asbestos. But. It's, it's is it something uh, because it's so unforeseen that insurance could probably uh, get involved with and pick up because it's on town property? Uh, certainly can ask. Probably ought to look into that because I'm sure it's not going to be cheap. My suspicion is when the land was taken by eminent domain to build the school, they knocked the house down and buried it. And that's what we're looking at. And asbestos wasn't a problem then. Did I make a lot of sense? Was, I didn't know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah asbestos siding, depending on the size of the house. All the beds that have to go to Ohio. Yeah. Well, there, I know there's going to be a truck there, and they're going to yeah. be digging it out of the ground and putting it right into the truck. So well, the problem is the soil's contaminated too. Yeah. So it came from the ground. How can the soil be contaminated when it came from the ground? <laughs> I know the state don't want to answer yeah. that question yeah. either. I've asked. John, that's a bigger question than we can answer tonight. <laughs> okay. Uh, anyway, is that good? Anyway, they're continuing to move forward on other parts of the project that okay. are not. There. Yeah, we're and just so, stuck on both ends accessing. Yeah. <laughs> they uh, have finished the walls and they actually poured the patio, which is, as I say, the first long term permanent thing you're going to see at the senior center. The patio, patio is now there, so we can go <laughs> set up our chairs and you know, have tea or something. Watch the old. My grandpa. With a hard hat. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I think that's everything there that I can think of too. It's just construction as usual. No uh, change orders or anything to per, per, uh, to vote on this week. How about the fire substation? Um, I sent you all uh, mm -hmm. update on the start of the process. They had a pre-construction meeting, so I sent that all to you to look at. They are in the process of um, negotiating or contacting Carl's excavating to start the work up there. And there is a sub for the job. Pardon? They're going to yeah. be a sub yes. for the job. Have some local local yeah. They missed out over here. Yeah. yeah. So glad, glad they're getting in over the there. The senior center well, the contractor seems to be a pretty decent contractor. Yeah. yeah. He's got a good reputation. Yeah. 
That's the, the wheat contract for the fire They really are on top of it all, between the OPM, yeah, the yeah. architect, and the builder. Yeah. All right, well, just, no, you just have to have, make a motion to vote yeah. to approve the, uh, the contract. contract for make the fire substation. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Perfect. We're on our way. On our way, yep. Yeah. Okay. We'll be finished first. <laughs> Never know. Never know what you'll run into in a farmer's He's field over there. Okay, so um, just t two topics here that we need to establish some uh, select board committees for. The first one is the host community agreement for adult use marijuana facility. The second one is the human resource director position. So. Um, we can start with the host community agreement for adult use marijuana facility. We just need to volunteer to uh, form the subcommittee. Oh, I thought we did that last week. We didn't. We didn't uh, form the subcommittee. Oh. We're going to see if we can get some public interest. I think. What, where are we? Uh, I thought we were just going to keep it to the select board. I thought but it was just a board. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. Right. My thoughts were, um, you know, we could divide and conquer on this. Uh, you know couple people could do the uh, host community and a couple on the HR director so I didn't know if anybody wanted to take on both it seemed like a lot to take on both so mm -hmm. depends what time of the day you all want to meet because I'm not really available for during day day meetings yeah. so um, I'm not either so it's yeah. mm -hmm. so human resource director position or whatever is that going to be during the day that people would want to meet on that or or for the adult uses are, are we also um, when, when do we want to meet on those things um, it's hard to meet during the day I just what, did, what, yeah, did you, I what did you do with the uh, medical we did the host during the day well, David and I met. Yeah. Yeah. The chairman and David did, right? It was Guilford and Molly and yeah. I. Yeah. Uh, I put together the initial draft, and then we did the uh, the negotiations after that. I would think that would probably have to be during the day since they're a business, yeah. Yeah. business hours kind of thing. Mm -hmm. but, uh, I think the HR could probably be done just like the DPW at night for so the interviews. So maybe yeah. Christian and I could do the host because we have more flexibility. Yeah. I'll do that. Yeah. yeah. I, don't, I was going to volunteer to do the host community too so okay. um, that's good with me yeah so and I have time during the day <laughs> yeah, I could do the human resource one yeah after after hours yeah I'd be happy to do it after hours so okay. Christian Stanley and Molly Keegan on the host community agreement Joyce Chunglo and David Phil on the HR position yep perfect this is John Moskowitz guy over here <laughs> he's hey. got time during the day <laughs> Beat me too. Yeah. Well, please, you want it? You, you can want jump it? on. You want it? You can what one on. do you want to do? Get on both of them. <laughs> there you go. And there's three and three. No, then we'll have to schedule one. Just have to post it. Yeah. Oh, that's really... We don't have to. Oh, with three. Yeah, yeah that's true. Yeah. Um, um. What the? Do we have a meeting on the? Uh, you, you're skipping all over the place here. Though. I know. Kind of lighting project. Do we have a meeting posted for that day? For the no, Route 9 widening, yeah. right now there's a uh, stakeholders meeting scheduled for the afternoon over at District 2 at, on the 25th and then at 6 p.m. is the public hearing on the 25% completes for Mass DOT over at Hopkins Academy. I think we should post a meeting for that day since most day of us will probably be there. Tuesday the 25th. Tuesday night. I'm definitely I don't get out of work until I got a class to teach that night. So I won't be out till six thirty. No, all, all I'm saying is that if there's more than three of us gonna be there, oh, yeah. we I should post it as a meeting. I won't be there that night. I'm definitely gonna be there. I've got the hearing at six o'clock on the public hearing. You're talking about going over at five o'clock or something? Yeah. That was when <coughs> what six? No, or? six to eight thirty. Yeah. But six. we don't have to post unless we're talking about something. Isn't that just We're, a public hearing? Yeah, yeah, we just public yeah, yeah, we aren't going to be saying anything. Yeah, yeah. just showing up yeah. person of interest. So 6 to 8.30 on the 
25th. 25th. Or there's the, the stakeholder meeting. I was planning on going to that one during the day, yeah, but on my schedule. Two o'clock, I think. Yeah. That's over at DOT? That, is that where it is? Yeah. How long does that usually last? Usually lasts about an hour. It's right next door, Joyce. I know. It's, just, I'm, it, I'm, it's, it's slow spinning tonight, but yeah. I was thinking that. I just feel like uh, as a select board, we might have more <laughs> options to say something at that stakeholders meeting than the yeah. public hearing. So that's 2 p.m. at DOT. On air. Um, th there's a lot of. Well, <clears throat> I don't know if, if uh, we have the minutes, but uh, what we voted on the lanes, because it looks like they've decided on two lanes with a left turn lane down the middle. And what, what that was what we, they presented to us. Yeah, what did we ever decide? We were decided on two lanes, or did we decide on. I don't, recall, I don't recall we they decided we anything. Decide on yeah. anything. They just presented they that presented to us. They presented it to us and they wanted our opinions on but it. But we didn't give them our opinion. opinion. I'll tell you that two lanes on each side and a turn lane down the center works in every other place in the world. So yeah. why wouldn't it work in Route 9? So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then you say people crash into each other trying to go around each other. You know, no, this is a single lane. This is a single lane with a middle turn lane. lane down the middle. Oh. This is this what you what ma UMass is pushing for two and two. That's yeah, there's not. Should, that's there, what it should be, yeah. But, but the not thing is, they, they want to have five foot and sidewalks along both yeah. sides yes. and separated bicycle lanes yeah. in each yes. direction. Yeah. So that's yeah. pushing. Yeah. Just take off no. all the businesses. <laughs> uh, no, absolutely. I, I agree with everything there. All I'm saying is the two single lanes yeah. probably should be two double lanes for emergency purposes down the road. I mean, well, we can't do five foot sidewalks on each side? Absolutely you can. That's what Why they not? have, yeah. They're, they're taking, gonna take people's property to put sidewalks a, all the way down Route 9? They're taking the land and we don't have enough and sidewalk issues. And who's gonna issue. take care of the sidewalks? We don't have enough of sidewalk issues here. See, Joyce, this no. is why you have to go to the stakeholder yeah. meeting. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe we should post it if Joyce is going. <laughs> <laughs> 2 p.m. at 25th. Yeah. <laughs> There's a meeting for okay. John to go to too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, I, I would I would like to go. I'll have to take some personal time, but uh, so it's the afternoon on the twenty fifth. Two o'clock. Two o'clock on the twenty fifth. Right. Over at District Two, uh, and I'm going to be at that meeting. I, I want to hear what what the public has to say about this. Also, I'm sure yeah. it's mm -hmm. going to be a big, big, big oh, I meeting. I think there'll be a lot of people. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> you know, they're only twenty five percent into this right now, Joyce. Oh, I know. And they still got. I, I've spoken with a few of the guys from District Two already. They're still doing a surveying down Route Nine right now. They haven't even started the land taking. It, this this is not going to happen by 2021. By 2021, no. you know. So let them let them let them take all these things into consideration before the final plans. You know, when when they're 50 percent or 75 percent, then it's over. They, they've already decided. But you got a new District Two supervisor over there now that sounds like he's going to listen to UMass and Amherst and Hadley and Northampton and we're, we're going to resolve this at some point here. Mm -hmm. So I think we need to, to bring all these options out on the table. Well, I don't know where we were. We certainly weren't contacted about the roundabout when we come over the bridge. I know. You know, and that's going to be one mess. It already is, already and they is haven't even started a construction yes. yet. Yeah. <laughs> we will see. They contacted nobody. Well, that was the editorial in the Gazette about that, actually. Yeah. Kind of like okay. when they started Next. installing sidewalks in front of the mall, they down Next. Okay, <laughs> so uh, we can go North Hadley Village Hall. Uh, we had the vote taken yesterday, and it did pass that the town was in favor of potentially demolishing town hall um, and provide more, or the North Hadley town hall, sorry, or village hall uh, I would like to make a motion space. that if the North Hadley village hall does not sell within six months, that we demolish it. Second. Six months? Any and further And so what discussion? is that, six months from now or six months from the listing? I would say... Six months from the listing. Six well, months. How, is that how far under out? contract or closed? Closed. Closed is plenty of time for that. But, um, well, that would be my opinion. So yeah. Yeah. I'll speak I for everybody. But, um, David, how far are we from getting a sign up and getting the thing going? Should be days. Just a couple of days. days. I mean, we've already signed the listing agreement. 
So then I would say from six months from now, that yeah. way we can get light a fire under them to get going. Yeah, I said, well, why don't we just say like by the end of the year? Uh -huh. <laughs> no pun intended. <laughs> you want to just say by the end of the calendar year? I'm going to look close enough yeah. to July. Yeah. Yeah. So um, if it doesn't sell by December 31st, then we open the discussion. Then for an annual meeting, we can get the funding together and actually build them now. Mm -hmm. I think we should just, uh, it would be a great um, experience yeah. for our fire department. Yeah. Just like we did by the uh, elementary school when we burnt, yeah. they burnt that house to practice center. Yeah. Anyways, that, anyway, so that I seconded it. Didn't I? You so seconded it. Any other discussion mm -hmm. or anything? Mm -hmm. uh, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Um, four committees. Uh, we have four different mission statements here. We put together for a form of government study committee, a economic development committee, civility and inclusion committee, and a climate change committee. Um, I have people that are interested in joining all of these committees. We don't necessarily have to vote them all in tonight. Um, just trying to get your feel for these committees and, um, and moving forward with them. Uh, we can prioritize them and can talk. One thing I was thinking is that if we do want to further them, we have a three week break between now and the next select board meeting. I can hold some preliminary meetings for some of these committees, engage interest, and see how many people we can get to, to, to sign on to them before we vote them in and have no one that's really interested in taking them under their wing. I personally don't want to be on any of them. <laughs> okay. Um, I think we got too much on our table. Right we have a now. lot on our plate. Yeah, I just don't want to be on any more committees <clears throat> at this point right mm -hmm. now. I think there's enough going on in town. But the we, building's uh, going on and everything else at this point. Yeah, I just 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 don't want to. And I'm just being honest at yeah. this point. I'm that's I think you that's pooped. good. Huh? You pooped. <laughs> yeah. I'm not that's pooped. I just think that we have now. Now we have the human resource thing. You've got the. Uh, that did, I mean, yeah. there's always something coming up that is taking a little bit more precedent than it just be on another committee. Hey. And I don't want to, you know. Uh, Squash enthusiasm. Exactly. Yes, you know, I got I, it. You know, I don't mean I don't mean to do that, but I just don't feel I can participate in this right now. I agree. I, I honestly feel like I've got a lot on my plate right now, both mm -hmm. both personally and with this. And I I personally need people that are really willing to take this ownership of this. And do it, and I'm more putting this out to the community yeah. as a as a way to get involved and mm -hmm. let their voices be heard. But personally, I am yeah. in that same court. Like yeah. I'm very busy, and this is a lot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I don't want to burn, burn, you're, myself, you're out. burn so, yourself out. So, so I'm doing. I'm hope, hoping that we can have some preliminary meetings. If there are people that are really interested and want to take ownership. Mm -hmm. Let's move forward. If there aren't, honestly, at this point, I, I don't have the stamina to take it on myself so and carry it forward. The Civility and Diversity <laughs> Committee, I think, is the only one we actually voted to establish at this point. Isn't, isn't that the one that we had voted to? We we did. We had started. Yeah. We there mm -hmm. was one. Okay. So we I think had happened done to some that? preliminary. It never really got moving. Well, mm -hmm. I, I I don't think that there was an issue after that. Yeah. One got resolved. Yeah. yeah. Uh, until it's just been brought up recently, so. Mm -hmm. um, but I think maybe that one there would be if there was enough community involvement to community community. run run with right. that. Mm -hmm. um, the, the others, I don't really have the time or the the interest to pursue personally. Um, yeah. And I, I we haven't voted on establishing those three, so maybe do we want to hold off on that and just go with the diversity one? I, I don't know. I, don't know. I mean, if Christian wants to take your time <coughs> on your schedule and. Yeah. Do some legwork on that, yeah. or make some phone calls. Um, I'm fine, but yeah. yeah, I mean, I don't think there's any sense of let's just let's keen just do one for now. The diversity one, I think that's mm -hmm. the one that's probably okay. the most important right now. Yeah, that sounds and good. See if people want to um, jump on board with that, and not, and I, and I don't mean that some people. Um, you can't just have your own agenda. 
You know, yeah. it has to mm -hmm. be broad spectrum on that, that we have mm -hmm. to have it open and not just... Yeah, I don't want it to get taken over and be hyper-focused on Correct. one particular issue. I like it to be more broad-based and serving the town. Yes. So that exactly is something. Right. And that's, that issue that's where person. Mm -hmm. yeah. and that's where we need one or two of us involved with it, so it stays open. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, they have to come back for us to appoint to the committee anyway. Yeah, I wouldn't see any of these as over a one-year appointment at this point based on what we see. I mean, if it's not making any progress or it goes down that path, yeah, I mean, yeah. we can't keep it going. In. So, yeah. Exactly. All right, so, so is that okay? Yep, that's fine. Okay. And I can report back. Okay, okay thank you. Sounds good. Um, all right. Last thing I have here, I guess we have uh, Hadley Community Electricity Aggregation Project. Uh, 39 people attended. 39 people mm -hmm. attended. That's good. That good. community outreach. And um, everybody understands that they need to. It was much better. It really was, it came across much better than the letter. Yeah. I think people are unhappy that the law got written the way it did with the opt-out. The opt-out, That was yeah. explained, yeah. and it was also explained that Massachusetts was the first one to write the law, and everyone else has followed our pattern for doing mm -hmm. that. So, I don't know what they're going to do about it, but that, everybody heard it, and they were not, you know, questions were answered. Mm -hmm. It was very nice. And the Hadley Media streamed it. And it's been yeah. streamed. And they're probably yeah. you're rerunning it. Exactly. I saw it on them. Um, well, people yeah. were still asking, though, and I think we need to make it clear for maybe those that didn't go to the meeting is that um, some people have said that they just threw out the cards. They don't have them. Um, you do have the option of opting out, even if you're in it now. And you will not be penalized if, in a, even if it's a month or three months down the road, that you find that there's no difference. People are need to understand you will still receive your bill from Eversource. Yeah. So that will not change. You'll just see a change in the rate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's something where you're keep your off. bills so you can compare them. Yeah, and on your bill, typically they give you a year ago your usage right. at least. Mm -hmm. I don't know if they give you cost necessarily, but they yeah, give they you give usage. The price they do give you price. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and there you can opt out at any time. They do have a website. I did go on it. I didn't mm -hmm. fill anything out. It's Hadley, C E A, all one word, dot com. And you can opt out at that website or you can opt up there if you want to do the green energy program. And I don't know if we as a select board wanted to put out a letter. I had a draft letter that I thought we might be able to include in this week's board docs and, and agree to send it out, but it probably won't get, get out because we don't meet for another three weeks. No, but we, could, we can put it on the website, do an email blast. Yeah, I don't know if... And uh, we have another, uh, we're trying to set up another meeting with the community on July 9th. Dave, can we get the vendor or the contractor to provide some opt-out cards for town hall? Because the, sure. The, the response yeah, so then they'll be available here. They, they threw out the, yeah. the, the mailing and they don't want to yeah. go through the website. Yeah, yeah. And, and they can contact Eversource as well to opt out. That's one way to do it, according to the information I was reading. So you can opt out with on the Hadley CEA website, or you can call Eversource if you've got all your information available and just give them your utility information and they'll opt you out automatically, or they, they can opt you out, so to speak. Now, I don't know, the only thing I don't know, which I don't have to raise, is if you opt out, I don't know if you can opt back in. I think you can. Can you? You can? Yeah. Okay. So Jane's nodding her head. You could opt in if you want, yes. if you find your friends are having killer electricity deals and you want to opt back in because you opted out then you can do that too okay anything else on that and then the last thing town administrator report do you have anything david all right just very briefly just uh very briefly. very very briefly okay so we've been a little... it was too long last week yeah we had not we hadn't met for four weeks so there's a lot that Piled up. It's been almost exclusively uh, working on the standard and poor uh, hearing on uh, Friday. Uh, Zaturka Park, that project is now substantially complete. Really? So that, I've been buying a while. Yeah, cool. so we should be all set. Uh, Nick's, Sorry about that. <laughs> Nick's Hill project is substantially complete. Uh, up and running, doing on. very well. 
Upcoming uh, town actions, community events, there's the Hadley Beer and Cider Garden every Friday, June 14th, 21st, 28th, July 5th. June 21st, Standard & Poor's going to be here. We'll be with them all day long. 25th, that's Hopkins Academy, 6 o'clock, the public hearing for the Route 9 widening project, Mass DOT. July 4th, Independence Day, also my mother's birthday. Uh, Happy July. Birthday, Mom. Should we send cards? <laughs> <laughs> August 7th, the capital budgets are due. August 28th, the SWOT analyses are due. September 4th, special town meeting articles are due. October 24th, special town meeting. Okay. Good job. Thank you, Thank David. You. Thank you for keeping it brief. Yeah, David. Uh, any, uh, Council on Aging Van. Oh, oh, yeah. Oh, I was yeah, going to say, any announcements? Yeah. yeah. Indeed, and it's lovely. But we can't drive it yet because it's not registered. It's not registered. But, but then we need to work on it. We, we got to get this we think, taken care of tomorrow so that we can drive the uh, AAA. Drive oh, the register. You oh, SMP. AAA. Did you trade the old one in? Or? No, the town has it. Uh, we actually thought of it as a fundraiser. How much will you pay not to have it in your driveway? <laughs> there you go. <laughs> we're going to sell it at your next meeting. Any other uh, announcements? Uh, Anyone? Did you do anything with that safety? Uh, no, thank you for the I was going to remind you about that too. Yeah, All right, sorry. Away now. <laughs> uh, do you have any announcements? Any I've announcements? got one. Um, code red goes away June 30th. Sign up for Nixle. There's uh, plenty of information out there on how to sign up. Or contact you and I'll tell you how to sign up. Uh, and then we probably want to reach out to our surrounding towns because there's some people in, in uh, Sunderland that apparently signed up for Code Red in the past and didn't know we were switching. So I don't know if we can reach out to their towns to say. You may have to show me how to. All right. Okay. Uh, motion to adjourn. Second. Second. All those in favor. Aye. Aye.